Revolt Talk Shows is back. Unleashed, unabridged, uncensored, and unbelievable. Only on Sputnik Radio. Listening to Radio Sputnik. Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Welcome to the mother of all talk shows, the Open University of the Airwaves, the College of Knowledge, where tuition is absolutely free and you are encouraged to speak back to the teacher. It's the fastest growing show on the planet. I mean that, on the planet. And I'll explain why in a minute or two. The Donkey Derby, otherwise known as the Labour leadership election race, is underway. Or at least the candidates, the runners and riders, are gathering at the post. Donald Trump has been impeached. Has anyone noticed any difference? Will it make any difference? And as Syria looks forward, if that's the word, to another Christmas, where the infestation of jihadist extremism continues to linger in one far corner of their country, we talk to a legendary Syrian girl. All of it with the backdrop of a new Boris Johnson government. Brexit coming up fast on the 31st of January. And it didn't take Boris long to break his first promises, did it? Who would have thunk it? Now, this is radio with a difference. It's radio with pictures. So tune in, sit back, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a roller coaster ride. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. This is Radio Sputnik. This is London, but broadcasting to you, of course, all over the world, thanks to the wonders of the internet and sputniknews.com. We are on FM in the Washington DC area of the United States, 105.5 are the magic numbers there. We're on AM from coast to coast across the United States. We're available, of course, worldwide on the internet at sputniknews.com. But this is a radio show with a difference. It is a show that you can watch as well as listen. If you are watching on Facebook, as the biggest number of you are, then please share, share, share with all of your friends on Facebook. And you can watch on YouTube. And you can watch on Twitter, on my own portals, my own pages, or the pages of RT almost everywhere in the world, RT UK and everywhere else, more or less. I think Kyrgyzstan, RT and Sputnik are not yet taking us, but here's hoping that they will. Just about everyone else is. Last week, for the first time, we achieved well over half a million views. That's views alone. We've no idea who's listening on FM, who's listening on AM, who's listening on the internet, but it must be hundreds of thousands of people, which means that we're getting closer, much closer, to that magic number of one million viewers and listeners, all or part of the mother of all talk shows, which I set here six months ago. From a standing start, we have achieved quite astonishing progress. And the reason is not just because I'm reasonably good at this and because my friends through the glass are extremely good at what they do, but because the whole world knows that the so-called mainstream media acts as a prison. I was going to say prism, but I mean prism, locking out 
ideas that don't fit into the prevailing orthodoxy, locking in the practitioners of politics within the confines of that narrow dictatorship of the prevailing orthodoxy. And we don't. We have broken away from all that. We have kicked the jail down. We're free, free to air and free to speak. And for that, we must thank RT and Sputnik for giving us this splendid platform. It was an idea that time had come. Now, many ideas come and go. Sometimes they go up like a rocket and come down like a burnt stick. Is that the fate of Corbynism? That's one of the themes of what we'll be talking about this evening. I listen with great care to all the post-mortems of the general election, which led to the lowest number of Labour MPs since 1935 and the biggest Conservative share of the vote since Margaret Thatcher in 1979. And if you only listen to those post-mortems, you would conclude that the game is up. But it's very far from up. We have to accentuate some important points. First of all, Boris Johnson lifted the Conservative share of the vote by 1%, precisely 1%. Jeremy Corbyn lost a lot of parliamentary seats, but actually Jeremy Corbyn's vote just a week or so ago was higher than Tony Blair's last vote in his last winning general election higher than his successor, Gordon Brown's vote, higher than his successor, Ed Miliband's vote. So whilst the seat hall is disappointing to say the least to Mr. Corbyn, the vote is actually better than Blair, Brown and Miliband achieved in the three general elections before Jeremy Corbyn took over. Secondly, there is absolutely no case at all for arguing that it was Corbyn and Labour's socialist politics that led to the result that was so disappointing to all of Mr. Corbyn's supporters because Corbyn in the previous election, just two years before, had put forward virtually identical left of centre politics not as left as was painted, not as left as Michael Foote, for starters, in 1983, but a left-wing program at the election in 2017 got the best Labour result, the biggest lift in the share of the vote since Clement Attlee in 1945. And the manifesto in 2019, whilst far too long and with far too many goodies in it, gimmicks in it, such that it was no longer memorable before the ink had dried, was no more left-wing than the one previously in 2017. So the idea that it was the left-wing politics what done it simply doesn't fly, in my opinion. It was Brexit what done it. It was the gigantic, portentous Labour U-turn on Brexit that cost Jeremy Corbyn the election. That much is screamingly obvious to me, and indeed I predicted it for two long years, losing many Corbynista friends along the way who seem to imagine that you're being loyal to your friend if you let them drive the wrong way down the motorway. You're being loyal to your friend if you don't grab the keys or attempt to grab the keys and turn the steering wheel back into the right direction. Well, if that's loyalty, I don't want any part of that because I'm not loyal to any individual. I'm loyal to the ideas that Jeremy Corbyn was supposed to be spearheading. And when he allowed himself to be shackled, his limbs to be broken, to be strapped to a horse like El Cid and ride out at the head of an army that was no longer his army, indeed never was his army, namely the hundreds, 650 Labour candidates in the election, 
I knew that it was doomed and it was my duty as a free-thinking, free-speaking man to say so. I make no apology at all about that, but neither will I allow history to be rewritten. And now I come to the Labour leadership election, or the Donkey Derby, as I have dubbed it. It has begun farcically. Let me go through the runners and riders. Syriatum. I could start at the sublime, if there was anyone sublime, but I'll start at the ridiculous. David Lamy has just announced that he is going to be the first black and minority ethnic candidate to be leader of the Labour Party, except he isn't. Diane Abbott ran for the leadership of the Labour Party against Ed Miliband. And the last time I looked, she was from the black and minority ethnic communities. Moreover, David Lamy is one of those who did most to absolutely destroy Labour's position in the Midlands and in the North. And if Labour picks him, it's good night, Irene. David Lamy is running on the platform of care for refugees. But David Lamy's votes in Parliament have caused more refugees than almost any other member of Parliament. He is a serial offender. He is a repetitive warmonger. He's voted for every war, proselytized for every war, and voted against any inquiries into the wars he voted and proselytized for which caused the massive flow in refugees over which he now cries his crocodile tears. David Lamy says that he represents people of color, but David Lamy's votes in parliament caused the deaths of more people of color in the wars hitherto mentioned that he voted and championed and still votes and champions today. He's also a signed up supporter of an apartheid state. And therefore, as someone who's not in the Labour Party, who has no reason to wish it well, in a way, I hope they pick David Lamy. Or they could pick Jess Phillips, Jacob Rees Mogg's bosom buddy. They could pick Jess Phillips, who spent the last four and a half years trying to, politically speaking, murder the leader of her own party, whom she now excoriates as the man responsible for losing the election. Well, anybody would lose an election with hundreds of MPs stabbing them in the back, and one of them, Jess Phillips, stabbing him openly in the front, as she herself said that she would. Or you could vote for Yvette Cooper. She's in the race too. She's another serial warmonger. She's one of the leaders of the Labour Party that abstained on the welfare reform bill, which beggared hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions of people. She abstained on it. She said it was time for Labour to fundamentally change course in a right-wing Blairite direction. You could choose Yvette Cooper or Jess Phillips or David Lamy. Or you could go for Sir Keir Starmer. He was even more damaging than David Lamy to Labour's election prospects because Sir Keir, the former director of public prosecutions who did so much to keep Julian Assange holed up in the embassy in London, who did so much to try and persuade the Swedish authorities not to drop their vindictive, fictitious pursuit of Julian Assange on the so-called Swedish rape charges that never were. Sir Keir Starmer was the primary architect of the very policy U-turn that cost Labour the election. Now he wants you 
to vote for him to do as leader to the whole party what he successfully achieved as the so-called Brexit secretary, the actual anti-Brexit secretary under the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn. Now, his Wikipedia entry has been artfully uh, uh, edited by the usual suspects to uh, exclude the rather important information that Sir Keir is a multi-millionaire with a North London constituency who supports, until now, Britain's membership of the European Union. Does that sound like a winning ticket to you? Or you could try his North London neighbour, Lady Nuggy, otherwise known as Emily Thornberry. You know that mad woman that turned up at the Labour Party conference bedecked in a blue dress with gold stars around her neck, aping the European Union flag, the woman that took a picture of an England flag in a by-election a couple of years ago and had to resign from the Labour front bench, so sneeringly condescending was her comment and implication inference about the England flag. She thinks an England flag is something to be ashamed of and a European Union flag is something to wear around your neck, around your torso. You can choose Lady Nuggy if you like, though she's also a multi-millionaire. The Corbynites are utterly bereft and divided. They started out with a candidate on day one, Rebecca Long Bailey. But now they've got two candidates, Ian Lavery, the chairman of the Labour Party, a mine worker who barely held on to his seat, but who fought a valiant effort inside the shadow cabinet to try and stop this Europhile U-turn that caused the Labour Party so much grief at the general election. He's a fine man, a top man, but he can't get on the ballot paper because Rebecca Long Bailey is already the official Corbynite candidate. There are not many left-wing Labour MPs, and if they're divided into two parts, then arguably neither Long Bailey nor Lavery will get onto the ballot paper. That shows the chaos and confusion inside the camp of Jeremy Corbyn. I'm going to tell you something shocking. They'd be better keeping Corbyn there's no reason for Corbyn to give up. There's not another election for five years. The policies of Jeremy Corbyn are all individually popular. Why not have a long period of introspection, a long search for a successor that can do the job, if it can be done, of rebuilding that red wall that Boris Johnson destroyed so comprehensively just over a week ago. I have nothing bad to say about Rebecca Long Bailey. In fact, I have nothing to say about her at all. And isn't that the point? There is nothing, really, to be perfectly honest and to be as kind as I can be. There's nothing there. Her glasses are on, but there's nothing behind them. So if I were her, I wouldn't run for now. I'd let Lavery, a real workers' representative, run as the continuity Corbyn candidate, but still better to persuade Corbyn not to go at all. Now, I've got a poll here. Who would you invite for Christmas dinner? A, Boris Johnson. B, Emily Thornberry. C, someone else. <laughs> I'm definitely going for C. I don't know. Uh, about you. You can live vote now on my uh, Twitter feed. We'll be talking to one of the giants of the left in the United States of America, Professor Richard Wolff, about Donald Trump, about impeachment, about Joe Biden, about Bernie Sanders, about what's going to happen in the U.S. presidential election year, which is very shortly to come about. And we'll be talking to the famous Syrian girl.
partisan girl, the girl who bravely, when her life could have been at stake, stood up for the Syrian Arab Republic in its darkest hour, and who now has plenty to say about the debunking of the so-called chemical weapons attack at Douma, now utterly discredited, although you won't hear or see any discussion of that except here on the mother of all talk shows. I'll be right back. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Tune in every Thursday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for the regular segment called Veterans for Peace, where we focus on the contemporary issues of war and peace that affect veterans, their families, the country, and the world as a whole. Veterans for Peace President Jerry Condon joins the show every Thursday. Hear about this and more every Thursday right here on Radio Sputnik. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Now you can call the show, 0207 982 Let me read that again, 0207 982 255. And if you're in the US, you can call 001-757-744-4480. You can also tweet us at George Galloway, at RTUK News. Don't forget to at both of us. There's also GG Motes, I think. You can also tweet there at GG Motes. Now, as I've said before, I would have been proud of the stand that I myself made for the Syrian Arab Republic, whatever happened. I'm especially proud now that we have almost won the war, but the key word is almost, because killing, dying, suffering is still going on because of the remnants of the Islamist alphabet soup that remain under Western and Turkish protection in one corner of the Syrian Arab Republic. But I took the stand that I did with no threat at all to my personal well-being. My first guest was not the same. She has become famous and become a hate figure, a real hate figure for all those who tried to destroy the Syrian Arab Republic. Her name is Maram Susli, though you probably know her better on social media a Syrian girl, partisan girl. Maram, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me back. It's great to be here. You were a big hit the last time you were on, and of course, uh, you had your uh, critics too, uh, but the vast majority of people found you a very refreshing breath of fresh air. So welcome back. Now, let's start with the war, and then we'll move on to Duma. Uh, how stands the war today as we approach yet another Christmas where war is still raging, at least in part of Syria? Well, I want to thank you for saying we haven't won the war yet, although we are winning. Because to say that we've won the war is to accept the status quo as it is, which is a divided Syria with Idlib province being controlled by al-Qaeda and with uh, everything east side of the Euphrates River being divided up between the U.S. and Turkey. And we have uh, been moving, at least the Syrian army has been pushing forward in Idlib and east of the Euphrates River. So the situation will eventually change. Uh, as you know, the Syrian government said repeatedly that the goal is to liberate every inch of Syria. And I want everyone to remember that that includes the Golan Heights. Um, so we will see how long that takes. Unfortunately, the neocons in the U.S. have sort of entrenched and found a way to still dig in and continue to occupy the Syrian oil fields, which they have now stated has been their main goal. Well, Donald Trump uh, openly stated, I like oil, he said, and he's openly stealing 
in what is undoubtedly a war crime. I mean, it's not prima facie. It is, without any fear of contradiction, a, a war crime to steal oil from a country in which you have no business and which you are militarily occupying is clearly a war crime. What's the situation in the rest of the country? Are these throat cutters still at large as a terrorist menace or is peace and quiet the norm in the rest of Syria? Well, other than Idlib, it's actually been a quite an improvement for the rest of Syria. Security is a lot better than it was a couple of years ago. And, you know, people are beginning to pick up and try to rebuild and, uh, you know, put their lives back together. Of course, unfortunately, because of the U.S. occupation of the oil fields and the economic sanctions, this has been slowed down. And if, the reason is they don't even want to make money off that oil. They just want to prolong serious suffering in, to, for Israel's sake at the end of the day. Are the refugees coming back? Um, from Lebanon, especially, the refugees are coming back. Uh, in Europe, some of the governments of Europe are actually blocking Syrians from trying to return to, ah. to Syria, so, which is interesting. Who would have thought it? Uh, the, there's an amnesty, isn't there? Everyone is welcome to come back. Absolutely. And the more uh, Syrians outside of Syria, the worse for Syria, because it's caused a brain drain as well. You know, anyone with a degree or especially medical doctors have been poached by Germany, which allowed them expedited entry into Germany uh, from Syria if they have a medical degree at a time of war, which was a terrible thing to do. So absolutely, there is an amnesty for people to return. And so uh, for someone like me to call on all Syrian refugees to return to their country and to help to rebuild it. Uh, that's the correct call, isn't it? Absolutely, it's the patriotic thing to do. And uh, I'm sure that someone would try to twist those words or manipulate it some way, because there is an agenda to try to take people out of their homelands, uh, the same way that the Palestinians were driven away from their homeland. Uh, the Syrians have been driven away, and some people would like to keep it that way. Now let's turn to Duma, uh, the OPCW uh, finding uh, that uh, a chemical weapon had been used uh, by the Syrian government at Duma is now largely discredited. Uh, I'd say entirely discredited, except virtually no one knows that it's been discredited because whistleblowers from amongst the inspectors have concluded and put in writing uh, that the official story uh, that warranted a blizzard of cruise missiles, hundreds of them, a million dollars a time, on Syria, was all based on a hoax. Tell us how that looks from where you sit. Well, you know, it's interesting because if we look back at during the Iraq war, you had Tony Blair saying he had absolute evidence that Saddam Hussein was going to attack the London in 30 minutes, or I don't remember exactly which city it was, but, uh, you know, they claimed that they had absolute evidence and then they launched the attack. And at that time, the OPCW actually said Iraq doesn't have any chemical weapons anymore. So at that time, the OPCW did have some credibility. But now, in the case of Syria, it turns out that they had to uh, put the OPCW in this very weak position and, and force it to destroy its own credibility in order to promote their war. And what's happened is that scientists inside the OPCW are unhappy with this. And so they've leaked emails to the to WikiLeaks, which of course Assange is in jail over, um, that the levels of chlorinated hydrocarbons or the level of chlorine that was in the walls and uh, you know in the in the room were basically at background levels that you would find in any home uh, that anyone that uses bleach cleaning products or anything like that, you would find those levels of chlorine in the home. But the OPCW actually omitted reporting those levels, um, which would have proved that no chemical chlorine attack took place. And of course, this comes with many other leaks that have happened over the last few months. I mean, in May, there was another leak by a OPCW engineer that said that the gas cylinder, which was found on the bed, would have had to have been manually placed there. He was British. Um, that was the British engineer. 
He said this, this uh, uh, weapon was neither dropped from the sky nor fired from a projectile. It had been laying on its side where it was. Which, if you saw the picture, it would make absolute sense because there's glassware all over the room that hasn't been destroyed or affected at all. And there's just a cylinder lying on a bed with, you know, how did it get there? So um, now that apparently there's 20 OPCW whistleblowers that have said that they're not happy with the final report that tried to, uh, you know, kind of claim or the final reporting on the report that it was a chlorine gas attack that came from the air and actually deleted those engineering reports that said that the gas cylinder was placed on the bed. And uh, this, led to, this led us closer to World War uh, than we've been since the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 1960s because um, Syria's allies, uh, Russia in particular, nuclear armed, multiply nuclear armed, uh, well, they are in situ in the very places where Britain and France and the United States in particular were hurling Tomahawk uh, cruise missiles all based on fake news. Absolutely. It's uh, the first time that the US and Russia have been in the same theater of war and they have not been on the same side of it, unlike World War II. So, um, you know, there was other things, the medical signs of the victims, none of them, none of the symptoms or the signs that they found showed that they died of chlorine gas. They must have died of something else. And the question is, how did they die? Who killed them and for, to what end? And you had uh, journalists like Jonathan Steele, which is just a mainstream British journalist, as far as I know, for the Daily Mail, spoke to one of the OPCW whistleblowers, and he showed him documents that US officials were pressuring the OPCW to find evidence of a chlorine gas attack and blame the Syrian government for it. Well, uh, there's uh, every reason to speculate that Western governments were not just covering up the truth about the Duma incident, but were actively engaged in creating it. Uh, in the run-up to it, we were repeatedly told uh, by Western officials uh, that such an attack was imminent, even though it made absolutely no military sense, still less political sense, for the uh, Syrian government to do it. So there's every reason to suspect that this was a deliberate false flag attack. Indeed, the Syrian government was within days of taking over the entire uh, area of Ghouta, and that's why the OPCW was even able to get in, because Al-Qaeda left the area and, uh, a few days later. Um, this is all reminiscent, of course, of the Iraq war, dos dodgy dossier, you know, the, the, the WMDs that were never found, uh, basically, they have a script and they're just following that same script and they have now, you, you know, over this, the OPCW has lost all credibility. But the frightening thing is, in a few days' time, the OPCW will have the ability to attribute blame, whereas they hadn't before. So uh, this is, I think, an attempt to try to get Syria under a Chapter 7 UN Security Council resolution, the same way they did in Iraq, and try to claim that, oh, they never got rid of chemical weapons. That's, that's the playbook that they play by. And of course, they have people like Elliot Higgins, which is a man they found in the UK who sells underwear, and, and they made him into um, their spokesperson who attacks engineers like Theodore Postal or attacks anyone who tries to bring out the truth about not just this chemical attack, but all the chemical attacks that have happened in Syria. Because from the very beginning, uh, we have been lied to, and the first chemical attack that happened in Syria was actually against the Syrian government and Syrian soldiers. So a Syrian government held area and Syrian soldiers were killed. That was the very first chemical attack. And that is why the Syrian government requested for the OPCW to enter Syria to investigate that attack. And on the day of their arrival was the chemical attack in Damascus that everybody heard about, which resulted in Syria giving up its chemical weapons. Now, you, you mentioned uh, Ghouta, uh, which brings back uh, memories uh, of me, uh, of, for me, of, uh, of Mother Agnes Mariam, uh, whose uh, archdiocese that was. Uh, I've often said that the Christian places in Syria are amongst, if not the 
holiest places I have ever been. Malula, for example, is just about uh, as pristine uh, a Christian site uh, of, uh, of worship, of pilgrimage, as anywhere in the entire world. The people even speaking the language of Jesus, Aramaic. Tell us something about how the Christian people in Syria, as we're coming up to Christmas, how the Christian people, how close they came to falling under the knives of these head-chopping, throat-cutting jihadists. Unfortunately, some of them did, um, especially in cities like Kassab, uh, in the north uh, west of Syria, which was completely overrun by Al-Qaeda. And of course, Al-Qaeda even kidnapped nuns in Ma'lula and in uh, Saidnaya, which is another uh, very old Christian city uh, in Syria. So, uh, you know, it's very ironic to have people like Mike Pence claiming to be Christian and all these evangelical Zionist Christians of the United States, and all that they've ever wanted to do is to annihilate Middle Eastern Christianity. From Syria to Iraq to Palestine, they have been consistently attacking churches, and or if not they themselves doing it, as in the Israeli military, um, they would get proxies to do it. Uh, such as Al-Qaeda in Syria. And the whole point is to try to segregate the Middle East uh, and to basically make purely Sunni states and purely Shiite states and purely Jewish states and purely Christian states so that they can pit them against each other. And having people live in a secular society is completely against that. And uh, where, will, will Christians be able to celebrate Christmas this year? Uh, in places like Aleppo, for example, or will they still be fearful? Well, they, the celebrations have already begun, um, and you'll be able to see videos of that and pictures of that on Twitter. And I think that this celebration will be bigger than the last, um, and hopefully in the future, uh, people will be able to be free to celebrate in areas that are now controlled by Al-Qaeda. Um, and of course, in Syria, we have a tradition that Everybody celebrates everybody else's religious holiday. So you have Muslims frequently having Christmas trees and celebrating Christmas. And then you have Christians, you know, making food for Ramadan and the Eid celebration in their churches. So that is a Syrian tradition. And, and this war has not been able to change that. Maram, God bless you and protect you. Thank you for joining us again on the mother Thank of all talk shows. That's Maram Susli, who is a truly remarkable young woman. Syrian girl on Twitter, partisan girl, I think, uh, elsewhere. Syrian girl is the name she'll always hold for me, talking about the effort that was made now for the best part of a decade to destroy secular Syria in aid of the worst cutthroats in existence on the earth. It's really almost impossible to believe. And our country, our government, and I'm sorry to say our armed forces, our special forces and our aerial forces have been misused by successive British governments to try and make them the special forces, the air forces of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. I find that almost impossible to believe. All logic screams against it. But what can we say of the United States, where the very organization which took down the Twin Towers, which killed almost 5,000 Americans on 9-11, 2001, the very organization, Al-Qaeda, is now the ally of this United States government and its predecessor. It's almost grotesque. It's almost impossible to believe. Yet that is what has happened. We have been giving military, financial, and political and diplomatic and media support to the worst people on the earth, all to get rid of President Bashar al-Assad, a man who not that long ago was living in Buckingham Palace as a guest of Her Majesty the Queen, who not that long before that was working as an ophthalmologist 
in a London hospital who went down the mall in an open carriage with Her Majesty the Queen, who was proposed by Tony Blair to be the beneficiary of an official state honor. If you can make sense of any of that, you're a better man than me, Gunga Din. Let's take a quick break. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us from mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video, when I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. We are talking... 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are listening. We give you the most essential out of the endless information space. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Only on Sputnik Radio. Who would you invite for Christmas dinner? An extraordinary 36% of you would invite Boris Johnson. Lock up your daughters and your wives, I say. Emily Thornberry, 8% of you would like to have Emily Thornberry for Christmas dinner. What? <laughs> I don't know why. What, to throw Brussels sprouts at her? Uh, and someone else is a whopping 56%. And a lot of you are suggesting just who that... Uh, someone else should be. Lots of tweets. D. Willer says, I'd like to invite Boris Johnson for dinner, then make sure I was out when he was due to turn up. Patrick McCarthy says, I'd invite both George Galloway and Jesse Ventura. I just hope the occasion doesn't result in a wrestling match between the two. Well, I'd definitely lose if it was that, but uh, I've met Jesse Ventura a couple of times. He's a wonderful guy and there's no reason at all for us to fight. Parliamentoro says, who even voted for Emily Thornberry? A comedian, no doubt. And Gregory Wonderwheel says, Jeremy Corbyn. So I could ask him, Jeremy, what in the world were you thinking of? Compromising with the Blairites on a Remain referendum. And Mr. Brown UK says, perhaps Farage, who seems a fun dinner guest, better lay in plenty of booze, or Nicola Sturgeon, whose brain I'd like to pick. <laughs> Don't invite me to be cruel. Regarding her views and possibilities for Scotland and how, how she would achieve her independence aims. Is the Catalan referendum route an option? Let me say something on that if I've uh, got a minute. As I said earlier, I think I'll be speaking in Scotland on the 18th of January at the East Kilbride Village Theatre. Uh, tickets are going like hot cakes. Half of them are sold already. So if you intend to come to that, please get your tickets quickly. And it'll be my first speaking engagement for quite some time. Uh, and I intend to lay out my case all over again to keep Scotland in the Union. I am one of those who accepts absolutely the right of the Scottish people to hold a referendum on independence any time they like. Boris Johnson has no right, in my opinion, to deny them uh, a referendum. I think he's got a right to say, well, not right now, because 
we're still leaving the European Union. And that's going to take a little while. And nobody yet knows what life is going to be like uh, outside of the European Union. Uh, but he can't deny it indefinitely. So I support uh, an Indy Ref 2. Uh, but I'll be fighting in Indy Ref 2 for the same result I helped achieve in Indy Ref 1, namely that Scotland should remain in the Union. For all the reasons you've heard me give before, you heard me give last week, but let me just underline uh, some of those. We are a small island of English-speaking people. To partition a small island of people who speak the same language, have the same culture, work for the same employers, join the same trade unions, read the same newspapers, read the same magazines, watch the same television, watch the same movies, listen to the same music, would be absolutely madness. It would be madness, it would be a self-injury, self-harm for the Scottish people to do that. And its consequences would be extremely grave, much more grave than when the nationalists last had a go in 2014, because, of course, a new Indy ref leading to, if it did, independence for Scotland when England and Wales had already left the European Union would posit still greater challenges than existed in 2014. For a start, there would be no free movement of cheap East European labour into England and Wales. So much of the free movement of cheap Eastern European labour that couldn't any longer get into England would go to Scotland instead. And if I'm any judge, many of them would be doing so in order as quietly but as quickly as possible to cross the border from Scotland into England, where they would not be able legally to work in the economy. That's not something England can possibly accept. And therefore, steps would have to be taken to stop it from happening. Now, the border between Scotland and England is 100 miles long. And don't get me started on the coast, on the sea around both countries, which is many thousands of miles of coastline in England and Scotland. But 100 miles is a land border. That land border would have to become a hard border. Think about it. Otherwise, Bulgarians and Romanians and Slovakians and so on that were seeking unlawfully to work in England would use their free movement into Scotland in order to bring about that could not possibly be accepted. Moreover, the Scotland I was born in and grew up in is not likely to welcome a huge increase in Eastern European people coming under the free movement rules uh, from Eastern Europe into Scotland. It's oftentimes claimed on here and on social media that Scotland is some kind of cold water Cuba, but it is not. The annual survey of British social attitudes shows the attitudes to immigration in Scotland are identical to attitudes to immigration in England, identical. So anyone who has the idea that a red carpet will be rolled out by the Scots for all those Eastern Europeans who can no longer get into England and are going to come to Scotland instead is fooling themselves. That's not what the result of that free movement would be. Moreover, if Scotland then applied as an independent country to join the European Union, let's leave aside any question of a Spanish veto, a very real question because of the Catalonian question in which the SNP have been deeply, heavily involved in fomenting Catalan separatism in Spain. And it only takes one European country to object, and that's a veto on Scotland's membership of the European Union. But park that for a moment. If Scotland joins the European Union, it will either have to join the Euro, which by rule it would have to do, or if some dispensation were made, 
because Scotland could not possibly qualify to join the Euro because it could not possibly satisfy the fiscal rules of the uh, Euro because of its huge deficit and because of its heavy reliance on public expenditure as opposed to private enterprise, Scotland would have to invent its own currency. Who would underwrite such a currency? I don't know anyone who would. And it will be up to Nicola Sturgeon to identify who would underwrite such a currency. Other fantasists, and this was the case in 2014, believed that the Bank of England, clue being in the name, would allow an independent Scotland to use its currency instead of the euro. Well, that ain't happening. It wasn't happening in 2014 when both countries were in the European Union. It's certainly not going to happen when one is in it and one is out of it. Quite apart from the fact that the vast majority of Scottish exports of goods and services go to England, why would you turn your back on that single market to join a single market in which you are a mere dot on the map of no interest to the big powerful forces that control the European Union? Why would you leave a union in which you have a democratic voice and not that long ago held almost all of the great offices of state, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, Alistair Darling, Robin Cook, Donald Dewar, I could go on and on, in order to be a tiny bit player in a union where there is no democracy at all. And then there's the question of the millions of Scottish people who live in England and the decent-sized number of English people who live in Scotland. The English people in Scotland are going to be allowed a vote under Nicola Sturgeon's Indie Ref 2 on whether Scotland, the land of my birth, becomes an independent state. But I, and millions like me, who are just as Scottish as any kilted SNP flag waver, will be denied a vote. Even though our parents are still living there, I'm going there in the morning as soon as the sun rises. I'll be there on the 18th of January, as I said in East Kilbride. I'm to have no say. Well, I'll tell you what, I might have no vote, but I definitely will have a say. Now, that's my piece on that. Uh, Chase is definitely not Boris Johnson for dinner. If someone's going to be a loud, drunken idiot at Christmas dinner, it's going to be me. <laughs> and uh, emails, remember you can email me. The email number is on air at ggmotes.com, on air at ggmotes.com. And I've got an email uh, from uh, S.M. Bakar Mehdi. Power to the people. The situation in India is tragic since the government have passed the draconian citizenship amendment bill. The protests are rampant. So far, more than 30 have been killed, more than 3,000 detained. The government is confiscating the property of the protesters. They are really acting in a fascist manner. Your attention is really needed, Mr. Galloway. Please respond. Well, I flew all the way to Karachi just a few weeks ago to give a speech, which is on YouTube, on precisely this subject. And I predicted before the uprising here that you refer to began that uh, Prime Minister Modi was going to lead to the destruction of India. He was going to lead to its breakup, his suppression of the Sikh people, his suppression of the people of Kashmir, of the people of Assam, his suppression of the rights of 200 million Muslims in India was all adding uh, to the combustible material that was going to explode, going to blow up in the face uh, of all decent Indians. And I'm not someone who wishes India ill. Far from it. I don't want to see India shattered and broken up into pieces. But the policy of repression of all minorities by Modi 
and the increasingly fascistic movement that he leads and personifies is going to lead to the breaking up of India and much blood besides. 39% of you want Boris Johnson for Christmas dinner. That's up four. Emily Thornberry's at six, down two, and someone else down one at 55%. The poll closes at 9 p.m. 1,540 people have voted so far. You can vote on my, um, my uh, Twitter uh, account, at George Galloway. Now, in the uh, second hour, we'll be talking to Dr. Richard Wolf, with whom I shared a platform in New York City uh, some years ago, some 10 years ago, after which my friend Ron Mackay and I stayed at the Trump Towers. Yeah, that's right. They booked us into Trump Towers by Central Park. We were filled with dread because even then, Donald Trump had a reputation as a gigantic bouffant barbarian. But actually, the hotel was surprisingly classy and nice. So I always associate uh, Richard Wolf with Donald Trump, uh, which is quite handy because that's what I'm going to be talking to Professor Wolf about this evening. Because Donald Trump has been impeached, or has he? That's the first question. Why did Nancy Pelosi not send the impeachment articles to the Senate and ask them to begin the trial of Donald J. Trump? What's going on on the Potomac? What's going on in the great battle that is now underway to choose a Democratic Party opponent for Donald Trump if Donald Trump successfully rides out this impeachment furore? What about Joe Biden? Surely the most waxen, ancient, leaking, teeth flying out across the studio floor candidate ever to be fielded for a US national presidency. What about Bernie Sanders, who's a year older than Joe Biden, but has, as far as I know, never shot his teeth out over a studio floor. His eyes have never bled live on television. He doesn't have a son working in the Ukraine and coining millions and millions of pounds trading on his father's name. Bernie Sanders has been on the right side of history on every matter since the 1960s. Bernie Sanders is a giant and Joe Biden is a waxwork. Yet Joe Biden remains the favorite for the Democratic Party nomination. I'll be talking uh, to Dr. Richard Wolf, who is professor of economics and author of Understanding Socialism. He's the host of Economic Update and co-founder of democracyatwork.info. I'll be talking to him on Bernie Sanders, on Joe Biden, on socialism in the United States and on Trump's impeachment. But after the news with Jamie Lowe. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, a progressive Democrat for America, PD, America.org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning, I'm looking for what's on the queue for today. I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Fault Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Lee and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. 
Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. 13 people are in hospital after being shot at a house party in Chicago with four critically injured. Police recovered a revolver from the scene on the city's south side in the early hours of Sunday. Two people are being questioned and the victims are between 16 and 48 and are suffering from various gunshot wounds to their bodies, according to Chicago police. The youngest victim is one of those critically injured but is said to be in a stable condition. The leader of the Australian state of New South Wales says the catastrophic wildfires have almost completely raised one Australian community to the ground. Gladys Berejiklian said there is not much left of the town of Balmoral, southwest of Sydney, where about 400 people live. Firefighters are struggling to contain wildfires burning across three states amid dry and hot conditions. However, Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who was forced to return from a family holiday in Hawaii to deal with the crisis, said it's not correct to link climate change to the country's devastating bushfires. He says there are many other factors responsible for the fires that have killed at least nine people. Earlier this month, Australia, one of the world's largest carbon emitters per capita due to its reliance on coal, was criticised at a UN climate change summit for its policy of using old carbon credits to count towards future emissions targets. Media reports in Britain are claiming that UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is reluctant to visit the United States because of the impeachment of US President Donald Trump. During a congratulatory telephone call, Trump invited Johnson to visit the US to celebrate his recent general election win. Trump told Johnson he and girlfriend Carrie Simmons could go wherever they wanted in the US. Downing Street sources say that Trump also invited Johnson to the White House, although formal discussions on the protocols for the visit are yet to be held. However, it is believed Johnson is resisting going prior to Trump's impeachment trial in the US Senate and before his January 31st Brexit deadline. According to sources, Johnson is widely expected to name Michael Gove as his new trade supremo responsible for talks. Neither Johnson nor Trump have commented on the reports. A six-year-old girl who found a message from a prisoner in China inside a Christmas card brought from the UK supermarket chain Tesco has said that she thought it was a prank. Florence Widdicombe described it as really weird to find the notes in the charity card. Florence, who lives with her family in West London, says she was sitting down at the table writing her cards to friends when she opened one and started laughing because someone had already written in the card. She then passed it on to her mum, who thought it was a prank. The message read, We are foreign prisoners in Shanghai Prison, China, forced to work against our will. Please help us and notify human rights organisations. Tesco said it was shocked by the find and had started an investigation and had also stopped working with the Chinese factory, where the card, decorated with a kitten wearing a Santa hat, was produced. And finally, four generations of the British royal family have been pictured mixing a Christmas pudding. The photos show the Queen, Prince Charles, Prince William and Prince George laughing together as they stir the fruit mixture in bowls at Buckingham Palace. The Christmas tree behind them is decorated with regal decorations and baubles including crowns, a corgi, a throne and a soldier in what appears to be a Scottish kilt. The cooking sessions were filmed and clips will be included in the Queen's annual Christmas message which is broadcast in the afternoon of Christmas Day. Missing from the picture is the Queen's husband, 98-year-old Prince Philip, who was admitted to hospital on Friday for treatment to what was described as a pre-existing medical condition. Well, that's the news here on Sputnik. I'm Jamie Lowe. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. 
Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. The number to call is 02077 982 252. That's 02077 982 255. Or from the US, 001 757 744 480. You can tweet me at George Galloway at RTUK News. Don't forget to at uh, both of us. You can also email me at onair at ggmotes. Now, as I said uh, earlier, um, Professor Richard Wolff is quite possibly the, the greatest socialist in America. And I'm inferring, though I don't know it, uh, that his preferred candidate for the Democratic Party nomination would be another man who ran and was elected to office for many years in the United States as a socialist. Not quite the socialist that I would say I was, or I don't even think as Richard Wolff is. But Dr. Wolff may be as excited as me at the possibility of a President Bernie Sanders. I don't know either what his point of view on the impeachment farce in the House of Representatives last week is. But mine is that it is a farce, that it's going to strengthen Donald Trump rather than weaken him. So let's delay no longer. On the Skype now, I hope, is Dr. Richard Wolf. Dr. Wolf, welcome. Thank you very much, George. I'm glad to uh, do this with you. I uh, don't know if you recall, but 10 years ago, we shared a platform in New York, uh, after which I found I was booked in by the organizers to Trump Towers, which was <laughs> surprisingly nice and not nearly as vulgar as I expected it to be. So when I hear your name, I always associate you uh, with Donald Trump. So let's start with him. Uh, it's my view that the Democrats have made a major strategic error in this whole Ukraine gate business and the impeachment that they have helped, not hindered Donald Trump. Where do you stand on that? Well, I think you're probably right. The time will tell. Uh, the sad thing for us, those of us on the left here in the United States, or at least a good number of us, is that the Democratic Party, and unfortunately most of it, uh, not just the centrists of the Clinton type and so on, uh, they are lost uh, in the reality of the Trump victory. They didn't figure out what it was about. They cannot admit uh, their own failings, so they have to find scapegoats. Uh, for the first half of his term, the scapegoat was Russian intervention. Uh, when that petered out and they could not get very far with that, they commenced this um, impeachment game. Uh, that's how it appears to most Americans, even those who don't like Trump, that this is one more effort to, uh, instead of Russia, now the bad one is Ukraine, uh, this amazing interest in looking for scapegoats so that the Democratic Party does not have to confront the structural uh, situation of a capitalism that is declining and that is hurting large numbers of people as it shifts the burden of its decline onto the mass of people, which, in all due respect, uh, ought to be familiar, I think, to a British audience since they've been going through that process even longer than we have here in the United States. Yes, quite so. Uh, help us with the technicalities. As I understand it, Nancy Pelosi was required to deliver the articles of impeachment promptly to the Senate so they could begin the trial of Donald Trump. But the last time I looked, that hasn't happened. What's that all about? Uh, the, the problem is a, a legal ambiguity. It is not crystal clear. It's nowhere spelled out. Uh, exactly what either promptly or appropriately or any of the other words uh, means. Is it a two days? Is it two weeks? Is it two months? What is going on? And precisely because this impeachment is not producing the avalanche of uh, negativity for the Trump people that the Democrats had hoped, my suspicion is that they're thinking that the longer they can keep this going, 
uh, the longer they have time to undermine the lopsided determination of the Republicans who control the Senate to bring this all to an end, the more it is to their uh, advantage. In other words, here you now have the country focused on this uh, theater of, a, of an impeachment trial. Uh, it isn't going well so far, so they're adjusting as they go along, and they found this little ambiguity, and so she's not turning it over for the trial that has to happen in the Senate, since everybody in the United States knows that all of the Republicans who remain the majority in the Senate have pledged that they will vote to um, acquit Mr. Trump, which is where the process legally uh, comes to a halt. You can't go any further. Uh, the, the Republicans and Trump have been very successful in converting uh, all of the issues that were raised uh, into a question of Republicans versus Democrats. This is a matter of struggle that most Americans have absolutely no interest in, believing fundamentally that it doesn't make much difference. Uh, it will not deprive Mr. Trump of the roughly a third of the people, maybe 40%, uh, who he can still count uh, on his side. It will not change the people who hate Trump. And so we sit in a kind of boring stalemate that is of interest only to the media who are required to keep it going, but has no deeper hold on anything of importance in this society. Let's uh, look at Trump uh, for a minute, if we can, Professor. He, he won these so-called Rust Belt states, the industrial and post-industrial heartlands of the United States, promising to make the smokestacks belch again, the mines to be productive again, the steelworks to smelt again. Has he achieved any of that? Absolutely not. I mean, there's, there's nobody, even my colleagues on the right, let alone my colleagues in the center, uh, would argue otherwise. I mean, he has not uh, revived manufacturing. He has not saved the coal mines from further uh, closing down. Uh, he has not done anything uh, about the inequality. In fact, the inequality in our society, by all the usual measures, is worse than it was when he became president. The only concrete things he's done, the one that outshines all the others, was the tax reduction in December of 2017, a massive gift to corporate America, uh, amounting to many, many billions of dollars. That was a real achievement. At the time, the Republicans controlled uh, both houses of the, of the Congress. Uh, he delivered to the corporations and the rich uh, at the end, by the way, of a 20-year period where they had become relatively richer and inequality much worse uh, than it had been for a century in this country. Uh, at the end of that period, he gave the rich an even bigger gift than they had dared to hope for. The other thing he can claim to have done is really a, a, a wonderful textbook example of political theater. And again, I defer to you in Great Britain uh, with Mr. Johnson. You probably don't need me to tell you about political theater. But let me finish briefly. We have been told that the rest of the world is cheating us. Mr. Trump is going to protect us from the foreigners, those poor Central Americans who want to come to the United States like everybody else since we killed off the native population uh, two centuries ago. Uh, he has blocked this invasion of foreigners, and he is now busy pushing back against all of the other parts of the world, Latin America, Europe, India, but above all, of course, China, the country most Americans know nothing about and enjoy bashing. And he bashes. He's going to hit them with a tariff now, a tariff tomorrow, a trade war. It's all highly theatrical, full of cameras whirring, end result, absolutely nothing. The new treaty with Canada and Mexico, the so-called new NAFTA, is a minimal rewrite of the old one. 
and we and two weeks ago he caved in because he needs it for his election and cut back the tariffs he had used to bash uh, the Chinese. Uh, just to show you how grotesque it is, each bashing of China carefully is edited to remove the harsh reality that roughly half of the goods that come in to the United States from China are made by subsidiaries of American companies who move to China to take advantage of lower wages, to take advantage of higher profits. Nobody put a gun to their head. They voluntarily exchanged their technology for access to the low wages and the exploding market that is China. But all of that is, is pushed aside and we have this a theatrical notion that the Chinese, whatever that means in, in these folks' mind, are the evildoers who are being pushed back by the heroic Trump on a horse who's protecting us. It is a, as I say, a textbook example of dealing with the contradictions of a capitalism in decline by a deft an insistent redirection of everybody's attention, whether it be against immigrants, whether it be a bashing China, and now whether it be uh, an impeachment theater, anything, anything other than dealing with the economic realities of this society, which are as severely negative for the mass of people today as they were when Mr. Trump made use of them to uh, get into the White House. Now, let's turn to the Democrats. Uh, you excoriated them uh, quite correctly uh, earlier. Uh, but let's talk about Bernie Sanders uh, specifically. He is, uh, what, what I see of what he's saying is as close to what you or I would say as anyone running and with a hope of winning the presidency of the United States could do. Have I got that? Have I characterized that? properly? Well, I would say yes and no. Uh, let me do the yes, certainly. And this is a country, the United States, and here we are different from Britain, uh, at least in a degree, if not in kind. We are now emerging out of a kind of hibernation. Uh, imagine the, the image of a bear going in the winter uh, to hide in a cave. We've had 75 years of anti-communist hysteria in the United States, so severe, so sustained, that it literally meant that in the colleges and universities, it was necessary for young academics with even a passing interest in things of socialism or communism or Marxism or anarchism or any of those things to carefully disconnect himself or herself from doing so. My colleagues are people even if they have some impulse in those directions, they never read a book, they never had a class, they never heard a lecture, they, they just don't know about it. And so they were caught up in the notion that capitalism was an absolute royal road to growth and prosperity forever, amen. When all of that collapsed in the crash of 2008, a process was unleashed that is carrying Bernie Sanders, myself, and people like us, like leaves in, an, in, in a torrent of a flooded river. Suddenly, everybody's catching up. Suddenly, capitalism isn't such a wonderful thing. Suddenly, being critical of capitalism is just this side of chic. And socialism is returning, and Marxism are returning. It's kind of a heady moment for folks like us me, who've been teaching that stuff for a while, etc. Nonetheless, it is amazing to watch. Nonetheless, I have to be uh, fair and honest, it's still a minority position. It's just enormously greater than it was five or ten years ago, kind of astonishingly, but the mass of people are still under the pressure of the Fox News people on one end, but even the establishment, which remains anti-communist down to the depths of its soul. So what you have in Bernie Sanders is, and I hear I agree with you, about as far as anyone daring uh, to take the label socialist uh, can go. 
And basically what Bernie is doing should be understood as a kind of updated version of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, or what in Europe is generally called social democracy. He is not attacking uh, corporate America. He will, uh, he says he will leave the corporations pretty much as they are. They will be subjected to a more progressive tax structure. There will be a more aggressive government providing uh, safety nets, welfare supports, job creation, and things like that. It is a New Deal, green or otherwise, and, and that's what he uh, is in favor of. I think, and here's why I guess I disagree a bit, I think that it may, I hope I'm wrong about this, but it may turn out to be that Bernie who is by far the best and the most progressive of all the candidates. Nobody else is really close, not even Elizabeth Warren, uh, who sometimes daringly uh, suggests it, but she really isn't. Um, my fear is that he will sh prove to be, ironically, the most progressive and at the same time, not progressive enough. In other words, He's appealing to the mass of the American working class to return to their hero of the 20th century, Roosevelt, by far the most popular, by far the most progressive. That makes a certain sense. But the problem is the American working class does have a historical memory. They fought very hard in the 1930s to get Social Security unemployment compensation, a federal jobs program, and the first minimum wage, just to pick the four outstanding examples. And over the last 60 years, they have watched what they fought hard for and achieved under Roosevelt to be taken away from them, half by the Republicans, and it has to be said, half by the Democrats, which is half the reason they don't vote for Democrats. It's not that they're fooled that Trump or Republicans will be better for them. It is out of a rage and anger at the Democratic failure, not only to build on what was achieved in the 1930s, but even to protect it from being destroyed. And therefore, they may not be willing to fight again for a Bernie who's going to bring them what they have seen, which is even if you get it, hard as that is, it will then be taken away. How and why? Because you've left in place the big corporations who gather into their hands the profits that the mass of workers produce and use them, if not to defeat a new deal, well then to unravel it after it passes and they will then only support a candidate who says that and who shows some capacity to take the struggle further so we don't repeat the unhappy history of the last 75 years. Can he win, Richard? Can he win Absolutely. the nomination? Bernie could win. You know, the irony is most Americans and I'm speaking here not just as a left winger, which I am, but, but as someone who spends a lot of time talking to people across the political spectrum. He can win because everybody basically that I speak to says he's the only Democratic candidate courageous enough, consistent enough uh, to have anyone take him seriously. The rest of them look like the conventional clowns. Uh, that is, people who say the right thing, but with no conviction, who carefully modulate what they say so as not to offend uh, the rich uh, corporate donor class, which supports the Democrats almost as much as it supports mm. the Republicans. Uh, and whether that's Warren on the left end of the middle uh, or Biden or now Bloomberg or even the rumors of Clinton coming back, these people are deaf. They will not win. Uh, they will not prevail against Mr. Trump. The irony is the one they don't want to win, the nomination, Sanders, is the best shot to defeat Trump. Because if you go to the working class areas, even in the American South, the only person they ever refer to as maybe 
getting their votes is Mr. Trump, excuse me, Mr. Sanders. And there should be no confusion about it. Mr. Trump was the extreme and he got elected in large part because he said, I'm not like the all those others. Mm -hmm. And that's much something that only Bernie can say on the left. A spellbinding uh, tour of the horizon. Thank you very much indeed, Professor, for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Dr. Richard Wolff, I don't know about you, but I need a break to contemplate all of that. Let's uh, take a quick break. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Tune in every Thursday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for the regular segment called Veterans for Peace, where we focus on the contemporary issues of war and peace that affect veterans, their families, the country, and the world as a whole. Veterans for Peace President Jerry Condon joins the show every Thursday. Hear about this and more every Thursday right here on Radio Sputnik. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Well, speaking strictly for me, I think the big takeaway from that last interview was what a pity that Dr. Richard Wolf is not running for the Democratic Party nomination. What a pity he's not the president of the United States. Now, on the poll, who would you invite for Christmas dinner? Boris Johnson, 38%, down one. Emily Thornberry, 6%, no change. Someone else, 56%, up one. Poll closes at 9 p.m. Vote now on my Twitter feed. Time for the weekly uh, feature on this day that my clever friends behind the glass put together for me. So I'm reading this for the first time. On this day in 1972, survivors of a plane crash in the Andes were found more than two months after their plane crashed into the Argentine mountains. 14 emaciated survivors were living in the wreckage of the plane. They would not have been found but for two of them walking 10 days through the mountains to alert the authorities. Four days after the discovery, a Chilean newspaper alleged that they became cannibals to warn off, ward off starvation. It turned out to be true. In 1993, a film based on the ordeal came out featuring Ethan Hawke. Hawke may be a method actor, but I doubt he gorged on human flesh in preparation. I told you this is not written by me. In 1989, after three decades, Berlin's most famous landmark, the Brandenburg Gate, reopened. The communist bloc was dissolving, and on this day, thousands of people turned out in the pelting rain to watch the West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl walk through the gate to be greeted by Hans Modrow, the East German Prime Minister. Two days later, currency controls and visa requirements were abandoned, and on Christmas Eve, more than a million people celebrated at the gate. Not so many celebrating today. On this day in 2003, Madonna, with whom I'm annually linked, on the count of having the same birthday, the American singer married movie director Guy Ritchie at Skibo Castle in the Scottish Highlands. Whatever happened to that? The singer Sting turned up in a kilt. That must have been something to see. This was... Uh, the day, uh, this was a day after the christening of the Ritchie's child, Rocco. The couple made a film together, Swept Away, which was a massive flop. A bit like the marriage, really. The day before, on December 21st, 1988, how I remember it, a Pan Am jumbo jet was blown up over the small Scottish borders village of Lockerbie, killing all 259 people on board. Two men accused of being Libyan intelligence agents were eventually charged with planting the bomb. Abdel Basit Ali Mohammed Al Megrahi was jailed for life in January 2001, following an 84 day trial under Scottish law at Camp Zeist in Holland. His alleged accomplice, 
Alamin Khalifa Fima was found not guilty. Al Megrahi was later released on compassionate grounds, suffering from terminal cancer. And on Christmas Day in 1989, deposed Romanian President Nicolae Ceausescu and his wife Elena were shot by a firing squad after a secret military tribunal found them both guilty of crimes against the state. Well, one of the uh, things that uh, goes, I suppose you could say it's the only positive of growing old, is that you remember all of these things that are being marked on this day. Just a few days after the execution of the Ceausescu's, I was myself in Romania, in Bucharest, which looked like Paris and smelt like Istanbul, with my friend Bob Wiley. And we uh, jointly authored a book called Downfall, the Ceausescu's and the Romanian Revolution. It was published in English as well as in Romanian. It did better in Romania than it did in Britain. And though the publisher went out of business, we did manage to salvage a few copies. Uh, I think there are some still available on eBay and places like it, but not many. Um, I'm proud of the book. I read it again recently. I interviewed the co-author, Bob Wiley, on the Sputnik show uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, sorry, for next Saturday. Uh, and I'm bound to say the analysis that uh, I made there in the first half of the book, which was written by me, second half written by my colleague, uh, the analysis I made in the first half of that book, I stand by. And um, it's a bit like the fall of the Berlin Wall. Not so many people celebrating uh, nowadays for all the positives that there are uh, about the life now in Romania. There are still many, many people nostalgic for the past, the certainties of the past. Uh, Chris says, I'd invite you for dinner, George. We'd have a right good debate and we wouldn't agree on everything. That's how it should be. Sam Lewis says, politics is never a good idea over a Christmas dinner. I'd pick Shane McGowan, get drunk and sing folk songs. Andrew Tor says, it would have to be Muhammad Ali. And I would have to ask him how disgusted he was at the horrific racism still happening to black Americans throughout the United States. Then we could enjoy a good dinner as a black and white man should. Merry Christmas to all at the mother of all talk shows. Carl Shields says, for those in Scotland that want to leave the UK, this is not about money. So I don't think they'll care. What I really don't get is they want to leave the UK to get independence and then join the EU, which will take their independence away again. And Peter says, I'm enjoying the show. Happy holidays. And Tom says, the Labour leadership election will no doubt lead to the election of a modern-day equivalent to Brutus. There's no choice in Labour. There's only betrayal, and within the tight grips of the Blairites within the party, there's therefore no future for Labour. They blame Corbyn and Corbynism for the Labour loss, but never themselves and their remain position. Will they ever learn? Or do you think they know the real reason why they lost? They just want to keep the fat checks, power, and Christmas gifts from Blair flowing in. Well, I think they uh, made Corbyn do a U-turn on Brexit precisely so that he would lose, so that they could take back the Labour Party, and they are on the brink of doing so again. Tony says, apparently US cruise missiles smashing into Syria is good, but Russian troops fighting terrorists in Syria is bad. Square that circle if you can. And Mohammed in Wembley says, I agree, we can continue with Corbyn as leader until the Labour leadership finds viable leadership candidates. Since John Smith, God bless his soul, Labour have not been able to put together a good bunch of leadership candidates for general elections. And Tony says, Scotland has a deficit of 6%, which is double the EU's allowable deficit of 3%. Also, the oil price has dropped considerably since Indy Ref won. And Alex McGuigan in Belfast says, hello, my friend, can I firstly wish you and your family a happy and peaceful Christmas from me, Charlene, and family. 
Secondly, can I express my admiration for the Syrian Arab army and my hopes for a unified, secular Syria, free from the satanic, head-chopping proxies of imperialism. Well said, Alex. And Tony says, we know that Western allies use terrorists to do their dirty work, funded by intelligence services. Let's take uh, the first call of the evening, which I did see appear uh, on my screen, just to remind you uh, of the uh, number to call, 02077 982255. And from America, 00001-757-744-4480. And you can tweet at George Galloway, at RTUK News. Now, I thought I had Alex from Redcar on the line, do I? We're just getting him uh, back. Adam Gary will be with me on the third hour. Uh, so if you have any questions for him, hashtag ask Adam and uh, pile them in here and uh, I'll make sure he gives you an answer. Walter's on the line in Blackpool. Walter, welcome. Uh, hello, George. Thanks very much for having me. Welcome. Um, but yeah, thanks so much. The, you asked earlier what person you would like to have for your uh, dinner guest. Well, I would suggest Ron Paul of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. And the reason why okay. is that he is the only major figure in United States politics to argue from, for disengagement of the United States from the world theater, for assuming a neutral role and not interfering into the world's affairs, reenacting the last reel of every John Wayne uh, movie as they go along. Mm. I agree with that. Uh, I'm not sure if he's been a guest on the show yet, but uh, we keep trying. Um, I, I forget now if we've had him, but uh, he is uh, admirable on international issues, no doubt about that. He is, though, uh, a, a sort of uh, low to zero government man in the yes, United States. So he, he has uh, this yeah. libertarian right wing political yeah, stand yeah. on internal matters. But yeah. as I don't live in the United States, I'd be quite happy uh, if he were president and took the United States back home, as it were. Yeah, that's an interesting point you made there, George. Now, I was listening very carefully to what uh, Dr. Richard Wolf was saying earlier. I think you have to disabuse the Americans one by one of some of the ingrained notions they have. And one of those ingrained notions they have is they have the right to play the world's policeman. Yeah. I don't think they're quite ready to go for that. And at the same time, the other ingrained notion, which is that the Americans are totally inimical to socialism. Mm -hmm. That can go... Look, once the... B billion, no, I would say trillions have been saved on uh, the in military industrial uh, complex in the United States. Then I think the next stage could be well, could it be that those trillions could be better spent on social services, on uh, public enterprise, on the infrastructure, etc.? No, I think that's a brilliant call, uh, Walter. Thanks uh, for kicking us off. Uh, with that really exceptionally eloquent call. Let's hear from Jared in Pennsylvania. Go ahead, Jared. Uh, hello, uh, season's greetings to you, uh, George. And to you, Merry Christmas when it comes. <laughs> um, getting ready for the holidays here. I want to talk about the fake news media, um, the MSN, and the propaganda campaign that is just being spewed 24-7 yeah. from the, 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 the things like BBC or CNN or any of these other networks. Yeah. And, you know, when Trump says that the media is fake news, he's not lying. He's no, very he's, much he's correct. Right. He's absolutely correct, yeah. And there's a reason Jeremy that Corbyn, Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn... Well, Jeremy Corbyn should have been saying the same thing from the beginning. I'm sorry, that's fake news. Exactly, that they, that they are spreading lies about the, like the DOMA thing in Syria that yeah. was just proven. And I, I, I feel that Bernie also needs to start calling out the fake news media, too, that he could win if he runs on a populist, anti-imperialist platform. Because as somebody who is a historian, I know my American history. And do you know who Williams Jennings Bryan is? No, I don't. Forgive me. 
he was the Democratic Party nominee from 1896 until about 1906, I believe. I'm a bit weak 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 on that period. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, he lost four times. He was a major figure in the progressive era, um, leading progressive. He was called the great commoner. He ran on a staunchly anti-imperialist um, pro-worker platform, but lost each time. But uh, he joined the Wilson administration, and he actually left the Wilson administration in 1915 when he protested against uh, Wilson pushing uh, warmongering after the Lusitania, claiming that while he condemned uh, uh, German U-boat attacks on merchant vessels, he also wanted to condemn the British blockade of Germany, leading to uh, great famine after the war. And he took over the Democratic Party and changed it. Uh, It was originally a very backwards party, but after he took it over, and Bernie could do the same. He, he could change the entire party. Do you think, he, like do, do, you, do you think he's going to uh, win the nomination, Jared, or are they going to cheat him again? I think he could do it. I seriously do believe it. If he wins Iowa, if he wins um, uh, New Hampshire, Nevada, and then South Carolina, I mean, I, I don't see him not losing. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree uh, with you. Thanks a lot for the call, Jared in Pennsylvania. Let's take a quick break. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us from mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video, when I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. We are talking... 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are listening. We give you the most essential out of the endless information space. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Only on Sputnik Radio. Now, Sue Evans in Stafford says, who would you most like to invite for Christmas dinner? I would invite Julian Assange, no contest. Along with all the other reasons to do so, he just needs to be out of that damn prison. What a beautiful suggestion, uh, Sue. I wish I'd thought of including that in the poll. It is utterly heartbreaking and to our shame forever. Uh, that this fine man, this hero, this man who should be receiving Nobel laureates, should instead be spending Christmas behind the grim prison walls of Britain's Guantanamo Bay at Belmarsh Prison. In his hearing this week, it was absolutely astounding to hear what was said and then to contemplate that it's still most likely that Assange will be extradited to the United States, where he will face an unfair trial and a grossly disproportionate punishment of 150 years of penal servitude in the US injustice system. First of all, the judge 
explicitly stated in open court that the government were very keen uh, that this matter should be dealt with in the allotted time and that it should be dealt with promptly, thus slaying, slaughtering on the altar in front of us all the notion that the British government and the British judiciary were entirely separate institutions and that the government can have no say in the course of British justice. But the good thing was Julian's legal team, perhaps for the first time, certainly for the first time in a big way, and that I was able myself to see and hear, the category of political offences is explicitly, specifically excluded from the extradition treaty that David Blunkett sneaked through in the summer when the House was not sitting, between Britain and the United States back in 2007. Now, I know that personally because as someone who would have opposed that treaty if I had been able to do so, if it had not been secretly done behind Parliament's back, I went to see the then Home Secretary, David Blunkett, about it. And I railed at him all the dangers for political prisoners, for accused people, particularly in that era uh, of, uh, of uh, Irish republicanism. I talked about political offenses, political crimes, and he absolutely poured oil on my troubled waters. He said that political offenses were specifically excluded in the extradition treaty and that therefore I needn't worry my then pretty little head uh, on all these counts, that it could never happen. Someone accused in America of political offenses could never be extradited to the United States. I must say, to some extent, he managed to persuade me that that was so and yet Julian Assange's charges could not be more political in nature. It's impossible to imagine charges that would be more political than these. Blowing the whistle on US war crimes in Iraq, what could be more political than that? And yet that very same extradition treaty is now being used to extradite Julian Assange. Uh, this one from Lauren Kell Salmonson. Uh, I just discovered last Sunday and greatly enjoyed your broadcast, the greatest talk show. I've been living in Fairfield, Iowa for 10 years now. I'm mystified that the Democratic Party locals don't campaign between elections or even during pre-election campaigns properly. All older white women were starting in an organizing committee meeting last March, and since when I asked for literature, flyers, etc., that I could take door to door and to public places, they have provided nothing to me. Sounds a bit like the Labour Party normally, Lauren. Thank you uh, for that. And Dave says, my question for you is, why didn't Corbyn purge his party of the worst of the Blairites for bringing the party into disrepute? and have his members at the Labour Party conference pass mandatory reselection for all parliamentary Labour Party MPs by local Labour members who overwhelmingly supported Corbyn. This would have purged all these Blairites who have no place in a socialist Labour Party and whom the members of the Labour Party and the activists from the local Labour parties detest and resent. Thanks for reading my question. Well, Dave, uh, he could and should have done. It is quite simply inexplicable that Tony Blair remains a member in good standing of the Labour Party, as does Peter Mandelson, as do Jack Straw, Jeff Hoon, and all the other war criminals exposed by the Chilcot Inquiry. It is inexplicable that Tony Blair, despite repeatedly inviting 
members of the public to vote for anything but Labour has retained his Labour membership card. But in truth, Blair would be able to dictate the pace and course of events, whether he was in the Labour Party or not. Uh, but that is precisely what he has done. Blair is in command of the Labour Party today. He is in charge of the course of events. He drove the uh, Brexit U-turn that cost Labour the election. And I believe he did so knowing that it would lose Labour that election and thus Corbyn the leadership and thus a counter-revolution could then begin. And it has begun. I spoke earlier and nobody's called on that yet, by the way, 02077 982 255. Tell me what you think of the Labour candidates for leader. I gave you my opinions quite candidly, quite frankly. Uh, but you can see it in that lineup. Almost all the candidates, Lisa Nandy, David Lamy, Yvette Cooper, Sir Keir Starmer, Lady Emily Thornberry, these are all proto uh, Blair candidates. They are Blair by another name or in other dress. Uh, these, Jess Phillips, my goodness, how could I forget her? Uh, these are all clearly candidates for a return to Blairism. And Corbyn's forces are so unsure of the anointed one, Rebecca Long Bailey, uh, that another Corbyn candidate has now emerged, even though both of them cannot possibly be on the ballot paper. There's not enough left-wing Labour MPs to put both of them on the ballot paper. Indeed, if they split it, it could be that neither of them gets on the ballot paper. Let's uh, hear from Julian in London. Go ahead, Julian. Hello, George. Just picking up on Syria. Oh, I yes. was there as a tourist last week. Wow, as a tourist. So as a tourist. Tourism has begun again in Syria. Thank the yes, Lord. Yes, it, it Thank is. The Lord. Uh, and the friends I made said it was it slowly but surely coming back. And this year they've seen more tourists than they saw last year. And I'm hopeful for 2020 that it will just keep on rolling. I was in Malula that you mentioned, ah. where, where they speak Aramaic. How wonderful and a place the it is. the icons that were destroyed and damaged are still on display. And you see the sadness in the hearts of the people, but the optimism that hopefully this is over with and they can all move on together, whether Christian or Muslim, and even the Muslims in that town speak Aramaic as well. Did, and everyone uh, let is me very, interrupt very... you. Let me interrupt yeah, you uh, for, just for a minute. Did any of them ask you how come all these Christian leaders of all these Christian countries ended up supporting the Islamist hordes to murder Christians in Syria and destroy their holy places? Did anyone ask you that? No one asked me that, but I think the Christians that they would think of are Russia, and I saw a lot of people uh, mentioning and positive imagery. There was even plates saying, thank you, Russia, for your, um, for your help in all of this. And I think Russia is more of a Christian country than these other so-called... I don't think yeah, these although, other countries although, that you mentioned Pence, are thought of as Christian anymore. Well, yeah, maybe that's, uh, uh, maybe that's the point. Uh, but Pence and Trump uh, wear their mm. evangelical insignia on their sleeves, uh, and yet there they were uh, paying the money for the mm. cutthroats to murder priests and nuns. You, can't, you couldn't make it up. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Anyway, tell but us I, more. Uh, what was it? What, were you safe there? I, I, I felt very safe. Um, I, w I was looked after uh, very well by locals. Safer, and I joked, safer than London in some places at some much, You know, the f a funny m moment, we were, we were in the, the souk in the market, and uh, a couple of little boys kind of started trouble with an old man, and there was almost like a little angry moment. And I said to the guide, this is the most dangerous moment of my trip in Syria so far. Yeah, amazing. You know, what, that said, what's I the saw standards? destruction. Yeah, what's the I standards? I saw the uh, evidence. Yeah, go on. So I, like traveling from Homs to Damascus and uh, Tartus on the coast, as you travel through, you can see uh, the destruction and, and the devastation. There's no doubt that there has been uh, conflict there, but 
peace has returned to this part of Syria. Obviously, I couldn't get as far north as Idlib, or I think that's the only area really that's unsafe at the minute. Yes, and that's the part that we uh, uh, control, uh, the West and Turkey. Uh, just let me ask you, did you get to Aleppo? No, I, 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 because Aleppo is in that direction, I think it would be difficult to get there. I had the option to go to Palmyra, but I, just because of time, I couldn't get that far. But a lot of the artifacts from Palmyra were actually uh, uh, removed and taken to a museum in Damascus. They were eager to preserve this culture and folklore. Well, Palmyra... They were descending onto Palmyra. Palmyra is one of the most magical spots on mm. Earth. It is mm. a, truly a wonder of the world. That's spelled P-A-L-M-Y-R-A. -A. If anyone gets the chance uh, to yeah. go there, uh, they yeah. should. I was just going to ask a banal question. Yeah. Uh, go on. Uh, what's the... the standards now of hotels and, and restaurants and transportation? Well, um, the, group, the, the, travel, the agency that looked after me, Marotta Tours, who you can find online, put me up in the nicest uh, uh, of hotels that I've ever stayed in and oh. in the best room. And they were so keen, I think. I mean, all, all the rooms were nice, but they were so keen to look after me and give me a good impression and the, the, the standard was very high very you could have been in any um uh, where a any mediterranean country, country. yeah the, the, the except electricity the food, except the food, five times the food a day. is better the food is better yeah so, the food so is better and, and the electricity is temperamental but uh, all this will improve with time i think fantastic call uh, julian thank you very much for making it that's julian in london who's just been on holiday in Syria. Just uh, fancy that. Uh, Mobin Isam Mohammed says, the Iraqi people are standing in protests since the 1st of October against corruption and demanding for major changes, including changes to the election system. Over 400 died in October, over 20,000 injured, more than 5,000 of those seriously. The chaotic weather in which government is trying to force another type of election system that is against the protests. A new PM the people are rejecting in protests. Looking for your opinion if you've been following the news here and what type of election system you think would suit better for diverse community with corrupted parties. Sorry for the long email. Looking forward to your opinion and to put some light at this chaos. Well, thanks, uh, Mobin. We did actually have a major debate on this, I think, last week uh, with Dr. Sami Ramadani. Why don't you uh, look that up on YouTube, see if it answers your questions. If not, ask me again uh, next week. Beck Robertson says, many working class people have turned away from Labour as they feel the party is now run by the middle class who push policies such as divisive and pointless identity politics, mass immigration, and remaining in the neoliberal globalist EU. Do you think the party would benefit from an approach similar to the one Blue Labour takes, adopting socialist or more socialist economics, but adhering to traditional working class values of community, family, and common sense? I admire your work and all you do and wish you best with your new party, the Workers' Party. Well, thanks, Beck, uh, for that last point. Uh, but yes, uh, undoubtedly, uh, Labour's infatuation, sometimes bordering on obsession uh, with racial politics, sexual politics, gender politics, transgender politics, even the Extinction Rebellion type of apocalypse now, environmentalism, all of these leave the mass of the working class people in this country, if you'll forgive the pun, absolutely cold. Labour needs to turn back to its formerly winning coalition of working class people as the bedrock and intellectuals and uh, socialists by theory, even from the upper class like Mr. Ben, as their allies but they've put the cart before the horse. They're now a party 
with virtually no workers. And a working class party without workers is uh, an oxymoron. A, a labor movement without workers is an oxymoron. But I'm afraid that that's what we have got when I look at the TUC and when I look at the Labour Party uh, in the Parliament. It is an oxymoron and it was a disaster waiting to happen. And indeed, happen it did. Let's take the news with Jamie Lowe. I'll be right back. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, a progressive Democrat for America, PD, America, Tata, org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning, I'm looking for what's on the queue for today. I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Fall Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Ali and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. 13 people are in hospital after being shot at a house party in Chicago with four critically injured. Police recovered a revolver from the scene on the city's south side in the early hours of Sunday. Two people are being questioned and the victims are between 16 and 48 and are suffering from various gunshot wounds to their bodies, according to Chicago police. The youngest victim is one of those critically injured but is said to be in a stable condition. The leader of the Australian state of New South Wales says the catastrophic wildfires have almost completely raised one Australian community to the ground. Gladys Berejiklian said there is not much left of the town of Balmoral, southwest of Sydney, where about 400 people live. Firefighters are struggling to contain wildfires burning across three states amid dry and hot conditions. However, Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who was forced to return from a family holiday in Hawaii to deal with the crisis, said it's not crazy to link climate change to the country's devastating bushfires. He says there are many other factors responsible for the fires that have killed at least nine people. Earlier this month, Australia, one of the world's largest carbon emitters per capita due to its reliance on coal, was criticised at a UN climate change summit for its policy of using old carbon credits to count towards future emissions targets. Media reports in Britain are claiming that UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is reluctant to visit the United States because of the impeachment of US President Donald Trump. During a congratulatory telephone call, Trump invited Johnson to visit the US to celebrate his recent general election win. Trump told Johnson he and girlfriend Carrie Simmons could go wherever they wanted in the US. Downing Street sources say that Trump also invited Johnson to the White House, although formal discussions on the protocols for the visit are yet to be held. However, it is believed Johnson is resisting going prior to Trump's impeachment trial in the US Senate and before his January 31st Brexit deadline. According to sources, Johnson is widely expected to name Michael Gove as his new trade supremo responsible for talks. Neither Johnson nor Trump have commented on the reports. 
A six-year-old girl who found a message from a prisoner in China inside a Christmas card brought from the UK supermarket chain Tesco has said that she thought it was a prank. Florence Widdicombe described it as really weird to find the notes in the charity card. Florence, who lives with her family in West London, says she was sitting down at the table writing her cards to friends when she opened one and started laughing because someone had already written in the card. She then passed it on to her mum, who thought it was a prank. The message read, We are foreign prisoners in Shanghai Prison, China, forced to work against our will. Please help us and notify human rights organisations. Tesco said it was shocked by the find and had started an investigation and had also stopped working with the Chinese factory, where the card, decorated with a kitten wearing a Santa hat, was produced. And finally, four generations of the British royal family have been pictured mixing a Christmas pudding. The photos show the Queen, Prince Charles, Prince William and Prince George laughing together as they stir the fruit mixture in bowls at Buckingham Palace. The Christmas tree behind them is decorated with regal decorations and baubles including crowns, a corgi, a throne and a soldier in what appears to be a Scottish kilt. The cooking sessions were filmed and clips will be included in the Queen's annual Christmas message which is broadcast in the afternoon of Christmas Day. Missing from the picture is the Queen's husband, 98-year-old Prince Philip, who was admitted to hospital on Friday for treatment to what was described as a pre-existing medical condition. Well, that's the news here on Sputnik. I'm Jamie Lowe. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. I'm joined by hashtag Ask Adam. Welcome, Adam, to our uh, final show before Christmas. Indeed. You and I will be together in Scotland on the 18th of January. I saw that Michael Gove was in for uh, promotion. Yes. Uh, he's going to be going around the world uh, um, making trade deals. First stop, Colombia. I think we'll get a stonking <laughs> trade deal with Colombia, don't you? Well, I would hope that his priorities would be US, China, some of the big powerhouse of the Commonwealth, but, you know, people it, will... People he might will stop spread. off. <laughs> stop off. <laughs> to blow his nose in, uh, in Colombia. One never uh, knows. Ask Adam, hashtag. The Flat Earther asks, I wish to ask Adam... How much of an economic boost can we expect to the economy in terms of trade, GDP, jobs, etc., when Britain signs free trade deals with the USA, Canada, Australia, China, South Korea, Japan, etc.? And do you think the EU will refuse to sign such a free trade deal with Britain, despite such a deal being in the EU's economic interest? Because the EU is still trying to punish the British people for having the temerity to vote to leave? Good question. Well, such a good question. I almost expect John Burko to bellow out order, order <laughs> before I stand up to answer. First of all, GDP isn't something I'm fond of. I'm fond of having a big one, but it's not the best measurement of genuine national wealth or even genuine national productivity, but it is what we've got, and I don't see people changing the measurement anytime soon. So that being said, of course, GDP and those other statistics that the caller mentioned, will no doubt go up whenever trade uh, barriers go down. Trade is always good for the economy, and there's an old saying by a Frenchman, quite ironically in the context of today's politics, that when trade crosses borders, armies do not. So trade is a win-win situation for all countries involved. Now, though, to the bit about the EU. Michel Barnier, who, unlike uh, Juncker, who's gone off to retire in a wine cellar somewhere, <laughs> And Tusk, who's uh, no longer even the world's second most famous Donald, the duck is now returned to his number two place behind <laughs> Mr. Trump. Uh, but uh, Barnier is continuing, and he's going to be the negotiator. But 
I think and I hope that Boris's team will be a lot tougher, a lot more clever, and put down the iron boot a lot firmer than Theresa May's high heel, which was always sort of, uh, sort of floating off the ground as she prostrated herself before Barnier and the rest of them. And based on everything that Boris has said, he's taking a kind of no prisoners approach. There's going to be a firm deadline that there's either going to be a trade deal with the EU or WTO trading conditions by the end of 2020. He's also clear that he doesn't want what the EU wants. They want regulatory alignment, which would essentially be a form of Brino, Brexit in name only. But Boris said he doesn't want that. He wants a genuine, straightforward FTA, which the European Union doesn't like. Uh, the European Union has many on paper FTAs with lots of countries, but is it really free trade? Not really. The EU likes to impose strict conditions and then they call something an FTA when a few of those, the, the more ghastly parts of those conditions are ameliorated. Let's hope though that Boris really kicks that door down and if the shareholders of companies like Mercedes, Daimler, Benz, uh, who make Mercedes, uh, VW, Siemens and all the big mainly German companies and their shareholders say, come on Mr. Barnier, come on Mrs. Merkel, don't play politics with our money. I do think that a good trade deal is very possible. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually a bit more optimistic than, uh, than you sound there. Um, at first, the EU bureaucracy said that Boris Johnson's timetable of the end of 2020 was completely unrealistic, and they used that in the uh, general election campaign before the vote. But no sooner was the vote in and the scale of Johnson's parliamentary majority clear, uh, they sort of changed their tune. Uh, suddenly they wanted to hurry everything up and uh, they seemed more optimistic yes. uh, that a deal can be struck for the reasons you mentioned. At the end of the day, you know, the European Union is a capitalist, free market, free enterprise uh, organization. That's what it exists for. They're very bad at it, mind you. Not bad, <laughs> perhaps, but that's yeah. what their articles of association are. And to erect barriers between uh, the EU and Britain when we have a very substantial deficit with them, uh, in other words, they would lose more than we if, uh, if trade stopped, uh, it seems uh, to me unlikely that at the end of the year they're going to hold that up. So yeah. I'm thinking there will be a deal. I think if someone wants to learn how to negotiate with the EU, just read your book where you talk about how to stand up to bullies, mm. because that's what the EU is, whether on trade deals, whether on foreign policy, whether on ascension talks to new members who want to join. I don't know who would want to join the EU, but a few countries. Scotland, <laughs> <laughs> yes. at least according to the SNP. Well, they have to get independent. You know, they're putting the cart before the horse there. But <laughs> yes, indeed, according to Mrs. Sturgeon, who is still on both the high road and the low and road. The low road. <laughs> That was one of your best lines. I have to use it next What's month. Pleasing. Uh, Patrick is on the line from Louisiana. He's got a question for you on a second referendum. Mm. Patrick, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Galloway. It's great to hear from you, gentlemen, as always. And a Thank very you. Merry Christmas to you and Adam both. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, I uh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. I wanted to call about, the, of course, the Scottish referendum. And when I examine it from a historical context, a historical perspective, um, mm. Scotland, it seems to me, really economically speaking, in terms of Scotland coming into its own, really occurred with the Act of Union of 1707. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had the Scottish Enlightenment, you had such notable, influential figures as David Hume and Adam Smith and all the Scottish inventors and, 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 and innovators, etc., that existed in the 18th and 19th and into the 20th centuries. Um, and it seems to me that Scotland is really in no position to be economically prosperous and, and, and progressive uh, and, in, and in a position to thrive as well in a variety of respects without some sort of union with, uh, with the United Kingdom. I mean, the history just shows us to be the case. So let me, I wanted to ask Adam, you as well, George, you know, since you're, you're, you're Scottish. Yeah, uh, and my, my, I've Scotland already laid out my view, so we'll, we'll let, leave this one to Adam. Uh, sorry, finish your question, Patrick. Sure. Oh, yes, 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 sir, yes, sir. Just, uh, does Adam, does, Adam, do you feel that Scotland, economically speaking, will kind of 
revert back to, I don't want to use the word backwater, but that it will, you know, be in, in, pre, in pretty dire economic shape if it does decide to break away from the United Kingdom? Adam. Well, it's very interesting, Patrick, that you mention uh, the Scottish Enlightenment, and one of the reasons for that was Scotland, during the even the 17th century, but particularly the 18th century after the Act of Union, had a far superior on the whole education system vis-à-vis -vis England, and especially in the Through sciences. Through most of the 20th century, that was also true. Yes, and the historical background of it is the Presbyterianism that informed Scottish education for a long time was more focused on pragmatic science than was English education, which uh, before the secularization of this part of the world was more informed by a more philosophical Anglicanism as opposed to the, this, this a more low church version of a Protestant work ethic which informed the Scottish egalitarian, or at least partly highly egalitarian in many ways, education system. Today, though, Scotland has even, when you compare a Scottish comprehensive to the average English comprehensive, Scotland is now below England, where for, as you say, a long time, well into the contemporary era, that wasn't the case. And economically, Scotland, which once had mighty industry from shipbuilding just being one of them, and great innovation, it's really fallen far behind, which again goes to show that money doesn't solve all problems. The Barnard formula, which exists in such a way that uh, taxpayers in most of the UK are subsidising uh, investment into Scotland, and it's actually made Scotland worse off than it was during the periods from 1701 into the early part of the post-war era. Now, I do think Scotland f would be much worse off outside of the Union for economic reasons, Reasons, and of course for cultural reasons, yeah, yeah. As, as, as you mentioned earlier. But like you, and unlike some, I think let's have a referendum. Uh, unlike many, even on the Brexit side, who have sort of referendagitis because of the whole debo the debacle, I, I've always liked referenda, and I like them now more than ever. Me too. Because, hey, <laughs> it took a while to get there. I always win them. <laughs> yeah, you have a good record. I don't know, maybe Mr. Ladbrook will call you up and give you some sort of Christmas present. I, I hope so. Um, but I like referenda because when politicians are in and God knows we've had a lot of that, a referendum, a simple binary choice. And I say, let Scotland have it. No one should be prohibited from having a referendum if they want one. I think that Sturgeon would lose by a fairly similar margin to that which she and Salmon and the other fishermen lost in 2014. But let them have it. I like democracy. They I said like it was uh, a once in a lifetime. Uh, it, that might be the lifetime of a Sturgeon. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but it's not the lifetime of a people. Uh, well, you know, and Salmons do swim upstream. Well, they do. <laughs> it's going to have to, but we better not go into that. Um, now, the uh, my point to add to that, Patrick, uh, would be would be this. Uh, it would be on the cultural point that Adam uh, just made. For the reasons I mentioned earlier, the idea that Scotland has more in common with Bulgaria and Romania than it does with England and Wales is quite obviously fanciful. Uh, we have been together for more than 300 years. We are grafted together like bone. Our finest hour uh, was spent together uh, when the Spitfires were overhead in the Battle of Britain. Nobody asked if the pilot was from Sutherland or Sunderland or Suffolk. They were part of the Royal Air Force that was defending this island against fascist barbarism. And we won, we prevailed as one people. And of course, in a long marriage, no doubt disgruntlement uh, can sometimes arise. Uh, no doubt a, a period of uh, conciliation, a period of separate holidays uh, might be uh, in order. But to divorce Scotland from England and Wales would be a profound economic and cultural mistake. I've been divorced more than once, uh, and there is no such thing as an amicable divorce. None. It never happens. And in a divorce between two countries, which had no reason to divorce, Scotland is not an occupied country. 
Scotland and England together occupied many other countries, most of the countries of the world. Scotland was an equal partner, in fact, often playing the leading role in the British Empire's expansion uh, across the globe. There are no tanks on the streets of Scotland. Scotland's not being robbed. It gets more money from the Exchequer than Sunderland or Liverpool uh, or South Wales. More, not less. And if you look at the political system, the media barons, uh, the editors, the correspondents, the talking heads on the television, the uh, people running banks, running big businesses in Britain, Scotland is disproportionately represented because we're quite good. Last word to you, Patrick. You know what, Mr. Galloway, you're exactly right. You can look at the Scottish influence in the context of the United States and the influence that the Scots and the Ulster Scots mm. or Scots Irish had on the United States. It did work for the Scottish Spidemen. The United well, we, States we, would never have existed. Yeah. Patrick, we even gave you Donald Trump, but let's uh, <laughs> let's quickly uh, yeah. uh, cover that one up. Thanks for the call, Patrick. I just let's... need to correct myself, actually. I said 1701, and I can already f hear the bagpipes of England. That was 1801 with Ireland. It's 1707. Yeah, well, 1701 was the Union of the Crowns, and yes. 1707 was, was the, the Union of, of the Parliament, yeah. the Act of Union. Sean, in Stevenage. Go ahead, Sean. <laughs> Evening, George. How you doing? Good. You want to talk about Labour? Go ahead. I did, I did. Uh, I, I rang you a couple of weeks back and, and I couldn't believe that 49% of working class folk were going to vote Tory. And you were right, they I did. Was, I was, you were... I was wrong once. I, I think it was 1978, maybe 77. <laughs> Blame the Bee Gees. <laughs> Blame the Bee Gees, Adam says. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, you asked for people to comment on those candidates. Yes, and, uh, yes. Bluntly. The reason I ended up voting Labour, and I did hold my nose to do it because of Jeremy's U-turn on, on Brexit, and even my, my missus, which, as I said to you last time, you've, you've managed to spark her interest in politics. Good. She was getting disillusioned with Jeremy's pronouncements on Remain and all that, but voted Labour because we went to see John Pilger's film, Dirty War on the NHS. And I it's wonderful, it, wonderful film. Brilliant film. I shook his hand after that and told him it was a brilliant film. And... Uh, it's a shame it couldn't have been shown before the election. Well, that uh, was deliberately suppressed by ITV. I, uh, well, what can you say? What mm -hmm. can you say? But, and therein lies a point. All of those candidates you mentioned, I, I cannot bring myself to vote for any of them. They would be quizlings for the corporations and for the neoliberal interests. And I couldn't bring myself to vote for any of them. I don't know about the, the Ian fella that you mentioned at yeah, the end. I, he's I, I don't not, I know mean, that much about it, him. Yeah, you, uh, I mean, he's uh, more of a backroom guy, uh, but he represents a mining community. He was himself a miner. Mm. Indeed, he was briefly the president of the National Union of Miners, uh, Mine Workers, before he went into Parliament. He's a steady, canny lad, uh, but he's not really leadership material. Uh, he's not uh, charismatic in any way. Uh, he's not... Uh, particularly good speaker, and so on. But compared to the rest of these people in that derby, uh, he's the only racehorse there. I mean, I call it a donkey derby for a reason. For me, uh, you could see them down on the beach at Blackpool. <laughs> well, that's probably where they deserve to be. In fact, they'd probably stay there while the tide comes in, if I had my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it is a problem, isn't it, Sean, that uh, Labour is so bereft that they're going to choose between uh, Keir Starmer, Emily Thornberry, Jess Phillips, disgrace. David Lammy. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean uh, how he's got the nerve. Well, he was, I don't know why he's got the nerve even to show his face in no. politics, never mind run to be leader. He was one of the front ones briefing against Corbyn straight away in front of the news totally in order right. to get an totally opposite right. message. And, and, and he was a part of the coup. And I, the coup in 2016. And I, I implored Corbyn not to give him that job. That job which could make or break the Labour Party. And he did give it to him. And he remained <laughs> loyal to all these people. The, the well, only, you know, Corbyn turned his back on the people that loved him and embraced the people that hated him. 
not well, knowing, I mean, apparently, that under their clothes were the short, sharp daggers with which they've now dispatched him. Well, a right knight of the long knives, I think. I, yeah. I voted for him in that leadership contest because I, uh, I've kept the union membership up yeah. over all these years, even though I'm no longer in manufacturing. I run my own small business now. Okay. Doing management consultancy. Uh, probably people should say, why are you still paying your union No, dues? good for you, mate. Good for because you. Because I'm a working lad. Yeah. That's why. Good for After you. After all these years, I'm... Uh, I'm as as, uh, as uh, Sir Van Morrison would say, you're a working man in your prime. Let's hear from Adam. Well, Let's hear from Adam on the Labour leadership contenders. Adam. Well, if... if, if if comedy was somehow listed on the stock exchange, it would be a time to buy, buy, buy. Because look what we've got. We've got Captain Cheekbones, Keir Starmer, who's the Brussels answer to the yeah, American Superman. Yeah, he's a, he's a, Burton's, uh, a, a Burton's tailor model. You know what I mean? The, you know the model that used to wear the latest suits? In he's the, available in the... at every fine men's clothing <laughs> shop in Brussels. And Strasbourg. We can't forget Strasbourg. No. Then we've got um, a snobbish woman who hates the English flag, but enjoys dressing up like the EU flag. Flag. Then we've got a gobby woman who talks only about herself, and even then it doesn't make much sense in the English language. Then you've got Ginger Corbyn, you've got Blonde Corbyn, uh, you've got a man who makes uh, fun of people who have taken their own lives through a gunshot wound to their mouth in the Houses of Parliament. I mean, it really is. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not just a dog's breakfast, it's a dog's buffet. It's absolutely, it's atrocious that a party that once, when, when, with the benefit of Google, anyone listening can check this out. When you look at TV and radio debates from the 60s, 70s, 50s, into the 80s, when there'd be a Labour man and a Tory man, occasionally a Liberal man there too, all three representatives of the, of the main national parties were articulate, they were informed, they were civilized, and none of those adjectives describe any of the candidates for, uh, for Labour leadership, which is, as someone who likes Boris Johnson, I'm quite chuffed, but as someone who realizes... Well, I mean, what does one make of David Lammy oh, putting dear. himself forward? I mean, first of all, he, he, he says he's the, he's the, he wants to be the first BAME, uh, leader, but Diane Abbott already ran uh, as the candidate mm. for leader. And then he says uh, that he's standing for the rights of refugees, having created more refugees than almost any other member of parliament. And when he's attacked, I know this for a personal fact, he plays the race card against anyone that attacks him. So if you attack him for things that he actually has done, has said, does believe, you get called a racist by David Lammy. How's that going to work? That'll look good on the, the national stage. Well, if the Labour leader was elected by Twitter trolls alone, he'd probably win with a 200% uh, margin of victory. Um, I don't know who's doing the maths, maybe one of his former front bench colleagues. <laughs> uh, but no, it's the, the, the whole thing. He's sort of the human loud hailer. He's the human troll, essentially, because he says in real life what most people only say when hiding behind pseudonyms online. It, it's quite disgraceful. Line. Uh, the human loud hailer will uh, live long. <laughs> Sean, thanks for your call and regards to your missus, please. Let's take a quick break after I tell you this. There's a second poll. What's in the Queen's handbag right now? A, a receipt from Pizza Express in Woking. <laughs> B, Prince Philip's car keys. We wish him a long life and hope he recovers from his recent uh, spill. Indeed. And C... Her German passport. Now, there's a thought. Maybe she'll stay in the European Union by invoking her former uh, Germanness. Okay, A, receipt from Pizza Express and walking. B, Prince Philip's car keys. C, her German passport. You can vote right now on my Twitter feed. We'll be right back. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Tune in every Thursday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for the regular segment called Veterans for Peace, where we focus on the contemporary issues of war and peace that affect veterans, their families, the country, and the world as a whole. Veterans for Peace President Jerry Condon joins the show every Thursday. Hear about this and more every Thursday right here on Radio Sputnik. 
We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Will in Singapore says, love your show, say hi to Singapore. Love hi, your Singapore. That's uh, Adam's favorite country. Are you as amused as I at the prospect of an extradition swap involving Julian Assange in exchange for Anne Sakulas, the wife of a U.S. spy who allegedly killed a young Brit, then skipped town? If you're ever in my city, you must let me buy you a mug or three of tea. Thanks for that, Will. I'll take you up on that. John says... Uh, hi, George and Adam. With the UN report linking 120,000 deaths in the UK to austerity and with poverty rising, could we see cannibalism taking place among the homeless of the UK in the near future? John, that's just uh, uh, ludicrous. Uh, but uh, austerity is over, isn't it, according to... Uh, your mate, uh, Boris Johnson? Well, I've never liked the term. I prefer the word administrative uh, errors because the, the money, the, the people in this country, like the US, like most Western economies, they're always spending money they don't have, which I'm totally opposed to. I think it's dishonest. I think it's immoral. I think it's a kind of theft from the poorest who always end up paying the burden of extreme debt one way or the other, either in the short term or the medium term, always in the long term. So what we saw is essentially not that the spending of money was being significantly curtailed, but that it was being spent on some things and not the others. And of course it was appalling when you saw money being taken away from pensioners and taken away from the needy, people that I still call the deserving poor, because in the 19th century people spoke much more plainly and much more honestly than they have in the post-Blair era where the English language has been ripped to port almost as much as the constitution of this country. Uh, so much for being unwritten. Tony Blair found a, a, a sharp knife and he ripped it apart nevertheless. But it does seem that when it comes to these issues of sort of social care, of the NHS, uh, of, the, of the deserving poor, uh, Boris is going to spend in ways in which Cameron and May did not. And one thing that really delighted me as someone who is the opposite of a Thatcherite, but someone who thinks Disraeli was the best prime minister this country ever had, with Lord Salisbury being a very, very close second, is that the Conservative uh, Party, and James Cleverly, the chairman in particular, is talking a lot about Benjamin Disraeli. And Benjamin Disraeli was all about a union between working class interests and traditional Tory interests. And Disraeli had these views from his earliest days, when he was part of the radical Tory Young England group, and into his later days when he gave a wink and a nod to Randolph Churchill, who himself formed the Tory democracy movement, a form of Tory radicalism, which took the country into lost decades of the 19th century. And so we'll have to see what happens. All governments are dishonest, and all government spending is a lot of smoke and mirrors, because as we were saying with the Barnard form formula, money isn't the solution to everything. Proper organization and proper efficiency with the money you have, I think is more important than the amount. That being said, there's some very interesting signs, and I think the talk about Disraeli and the lowering of the volume on Thatcher is, for me anyway, a very hopeful development. Let's take a call. Sarkar in Glasgow. Go ahead, Sarkar. Hi, George. Good evening. In fact, uh, amazing show, mate. Thank you so much that both you and Adam are here. And it's a very Thank important you. question I have to ask you, George. Go ahead, sir. I mean, first of all, congratulations on getting bang on another prediction right about the elections. Thank now, you. George, the thing which I want to ask you is seen how the SNP of late have literally gone ballistic since the election results came in. Yeah. They are going absolutely full, you know, lock, stock, barrel, asking for a second referendum. Yeah. According yeah. to them, every blame happens because of Westminster. Now, I'll tell you something, George, believe me, this is something which I've seen with my own eyes. You know the health, the police, the legal system, all these things are devolved in Scotland, but the drug problem which is so massive in Scotland. The SNP don't say a word about that. And believe me, everyone knows about that, but for some reason, none of the parties seem to talk well, about that. Well, they were that. all posing for a picture in my home <coughs> city of Dundee the other day, and they were all grinning uh, from ear to ear. Now, what they didn't divulge was that Dundee is the drug's death 
capital of Europe. I mean, and they've been in power for 10 years. What have they done about that? Zilch. And you know, George, the other sad part, and I'm saying this, and believe me, it's not newspaper news, because I know how newspapers work. With my own eyes, I've seen the way 14, 15-year-old kids are being proselytized to say, what a great project Scottish independence will be, how you guys are prisoners of Westminster. And on top of that, fully making kids fill up forms at the age of 12 and 13 to say either you can choose to be a male or a female or prefer not to disclose a gender or to consider yourself gender neutral. Really, are these things worth it to go for independence? Not a single discussion about policies, not a single discussion about Barnett formula, not a single discussion about how much they trade with UK compared to the rest of EU, whether they'll be a hard border or not. And these are the things they're focusing on, ignoring drug problems. What is the problem with SNP? When will they ever civilize? That's my question, George. They are, they are the, the Blairite party in Scotland. They have adopted all of the worst aspect of the Blair era and put a kilt on it. Am I right? <laughs> yes. Um, it's, there was actually a photo, and for legal purposes, it could have been photoshopped, but it appeared that Sturgeon was standing uh, next to two Scottish flags without the Union flag present, which is... No, it's, she was. It wasn't photoshopped. So I that was genuine. Well, I yeah. mean, I just think that that's so insulting because, I mean, Britain is still... It's weird, surreal, still a member of the European Union, only for another month and a week, but we can't deny reality. I mean, there'll be a lot of celebrations uh, uh, in, in my bedroom after, I just, well, that sounds weird, <laughs> on the 31st. No but, need to get personal. Quite so, <clears throat> especially not when we're talking about Mrs. Sturgeon. Uh, <laughs> but no, the SNP are behaving in such a childish way, and it was frankly encapsulated by um, Nicola Sturgeon's celebratory sort of break dance uh, when she was caught uh, off guard on camera when she found out that Joe Swinson I thought that was rather ugly seat. actually I, it was a uh, bit of for, uh, for a, a woman especially mm. I thought the schadenfreude on display was well rather uh, unbecoming I thought, I thought so too, because even though I'm about as far from a Lib Dem as day is tonight, I, I felt for, for Jo Swinson, uh, partly because she started her campaign by saying she was going to, she had every possibility of being the Prime Minister, which I suppose she still could if she gets appointed to the House of Lords and become the only Prime Minister from that House since one of my favourites, Lord Salisbury, but sh she ain't no Lord Salisbury. She ain't no Lord Salisbury. <laughs> Saka, thanks, an excellent call. Paul in Nottinghamshire. He disagrees with me on Bernie, so let's hear why. Paul, right. go ahead. Yes, I do indeed, George. Now, I agree with every single thing you say regarding other uh, matters, okay. political matters, but I cannot <clears throat> agree with uh, what Professor Richard Wolfe was saying, that, uh, the academic in America. Yeah. And I'd just say to you, George, you know, just look at uh, Bernie Sanders' voting record. You know, you get a flavour of you know, the sort of things that he supported. Over the years, you well, know, he opposed the Iraq war. He, he, he was he one voted, of the very few to oppose the Iraq war. Well, but he voted, uh, George, to finance the Iraq war. He also supported the sanctions in 1998 against Iraq. 500,000, uh, you know, people died as a result of that. He supported uh, the bombing of Kosovo. You know, it's, it's absolutely shocking. And he also opposed when Russia. And well, when uh, Crimea had uh, voted to join with Russia, he opposed a democratic vote, the democratic wishes of the Crimean people. You know, I could tell you lots of things, George. That, no, uh, you I, I, know, I, I, it's good. Uh, no, look, it's it's but, good uh, that you provided this uh, antidote uh, because we yeah. mustn't get carried away. But my mm -hmm. caveat was this, Paul, and I I remember saying exactly this to Professor Wolf that he has the best politics of anyone who realistically could become president of the United States. Surely you'd well, accept that point. Well, no, not really, George, because, you know, uh, I mean, look at Tulsi Gabbard. You know, the thing is she's got no chance. What he's voted on. But she's got well, no well, She's got well, better politics, growing, maybe, George. maybe, she's, but she can't yeah. win. Well, she is growing. She's massively growing across the United States. I don't, you think, know, I don't see very, any evidence for that. Paul. Yeah. Well, well, what kind of uh, government will we have if Bernie did come to power? Well, you know, I well a lot better than a, a lot better. Than, no, I'm not expecting him to bring socialism to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very long way uh, off. Uh, but yes. uh, it would be better than any democratic uh, president since 
uh, Roosevelt, in my opinion. And I think uh, Richard Wolff, who's left other than you and me, uh, uh, more or less conceded that point, didn't he? Well, he, yes, he, he did, George. But ask this question, you know, uh, will Bernie Sanders, if he became president of the United States of America, would he continue shoveling, you know, taxpayers' money into the pockets of the military-industrial complex? Well, not, just not, yeah. When you look at his record, well, previous record of voting, yeah, it tells okay. you probably well would. Well, the statements he's making day and daily, and I see them every day, uh, are mm -hmm. remarkably uh, progressive, left-wing, militant. In fact, I often find myself saying to myself, perhaps you shouldn't go that far out on a limb at this stage, because I wouldn't yes. want anything to happen to him, as can happen to people who challenge the prevailing orthodoxy in the United States, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see exactly what you mean, George. Paul, yeah, a very good call, uh, and it's always useful to uh, be the antidote to any unwitting uh, uh, hysteria. Paula is in London on Jeremy Corbyn. Paula? Oh, hi. Welcome. Oh, hi. Go ahead. Um, uh, I don't agree with you on your new party. I don't agree with you with uh, sharing the platform with uh, Suraj. Um, I can't hear you because I have the phone, um, I have the computer down, so otherwise it will be an echo. Paula is in London, on Jeremy Corbyn. Turn the computer right. down, Paula, yeah. We all heard you perfectly yeah, well. Uh, if I turn the computer down, can I then hear yeah, yes. what George is no, saying? You, you, you'll just hear me from the phone, so go ahead now. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As I said already, uh, I don't agree with you with on um, so many things. Mm -hmm. But on Jeremy Corbyn, mm -hmm. um, uh, where do I start? Um, I have in front of me an article from Jonathan Cook, um, the plot to keep Jeremy Corbyn out of power dated July 2019. Mm -hmm. And I think, in my opinion, that should be on all, all across newspapers and media. This mm. is the utopia. Well, I, 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 I recall uh, circulating it mightily uh, back then uh, myself, so perhaps that's something you agree with me on. But this is, you know, this is the sheer ignorance that has been going on for the last hundred years since we all became satellites of the U.S. Um, so, as I was saying to your producer earlier, I moved to this country in 1997, escaping Silvio Berlusconi in Italy, who won for the second time, I know, <laughs> with a landslide. And I just could not believe I was living in a fascist state after 30 years. You know, I moved to this country, I was But Berlusconi, well, Berlusconi's Italy was not a fascist state. Otherwise, Berlusconi would not have gone to prison and he would still be the leader. Why, 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 why do you, above all, where, where did, why, why do you, above you... all, as an Italian, uh, toss such uh, words around as if they were confetti? Sorry, I didn't get that at all. What, well, you, what well Berlusconi was not a fascist leader and his state was not a fascist state. If it were, Berlusconi would not have gone to prison and he would still be the leader. Why do you as an Italian throw words like that around so careful, carelessly? That's the point I was making to you. Carelessly? I mean, collusion with mafia. <laughs> but collu Sorry. collusion with mafia is what prime ministers of Italy have been doing for a hundred years. It doesn't make exactly it a fascist my, state. Precisely my point. No, it isn't. Precisely my point. It isn't your, precisely your point. You said that Berlusconi represented a fascist state. And I'm just tired of these words being bankrupted and devalued by leftists like you uh, who use them falsely and thus weaken their importance in the popular discourse. Because he's... I agree right entirely. Right. So, yeah. I agree right. entirely. Right. So Go how ahead. I'm would glad you, you do. how would you how would you describe Silvio Berlusconi then? As a I right mean, as a right wing populist leader who was there today and gone tomorrow. He's now nothing, nobody. 
Well, <laughs> I wish I wish I could share your. Uh, well, what, what power? Your... Do, what power does Berlusconi have now? I mean, talk about well, talk about yesterday's man. My goodness. Um, does the the name uh, Matteo Renzi ring any bell in your well, in your? Yes, but you. But it's, you God's son. it's you that, that mentioned Berlusconi, not me. Because I no longer think about Berlusconi. It was you that brought him up. Well, you probably, anyway, you probably anyway, don't. Paula, Paula, anyway, Paula, let's move over. Move, so move what on I to am your saying point. Is, yeah. Yeah, what, moving on, I am saying this, uh, that I, <laughs> stupidly, I thought that Tony Blair was better than Berlusconi when I moved to this country in uh, 1997. They were bosom buddies. Precisely, precisely. And I, you know, I was, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about it. I just wanted to get out of that regime in my mm. country. Mm. And basically, 22 years later, that's what I am trying to say. 22 years later, I found myself in the same position, if not worse. You know, uh, it has come back to me with a vengeance with this regime. Um, Which for, regime? The Boris Johnson one that was Boris elected Johnson last week? Regime. And I can't Why is it, how get... is it a regime? Uh, let's deal... Ontology is very important, Paula. Uh, you mustn't use words that bankrupt them of their meaning. Boris Johnson won a democratic election here last week. It's an imperfect democracy, but he won well, it on, right, he won it on the popular about... vote. So it's not a regime. Well, let's get straight to the point. What I wish you role... Would. Sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to open a parenthesis, but you are talking to, despite I've lived here 22 years, you are talking to a non-native, and I admire your eloquence and your, you know, the way you can play with words, but I, I'm sorry, I could do that in my language. I can't. I'm not mature enough to do it in, in... So I appreciate you, you know, taking me on bankrupting the meaning and whatever, but I am still because not all I'm saying is you have, No, all I'm saying is you have to use words carefully. Uh, uh, an, elected, right. an elected government is not a regime. A right-wing right. populist so is not a fascist. What, uh, and if you, right. if you overuse these words, you, you devalue their meaning. All right, all right, thank you very much. Now, my point is, what, in your opinion, the role of the media, talking of bankrupt, mm. uh, what's, in your opinion, the role of the media? Well, and uh, going back to Jonathan Cook. Yeah, uh, well... John, and going John, back to Lee Camp. You know, I yeah. watch Lee Camp, I mm. watch you, mm. I read Jonathan Cook, I support Andrew Murray, uh, I have given so much of my little money to independent media. But Good. the bottom line, in my opinion, is we need to get rid of mainstream media. Well, that's a good... Well, let me stop you there, because of the hour uh, only. Uh, uh, what I think about the mainstream media is uh, screamingly evident uh, every Sunday night for three hours on this radio and television show. Uh, it is my case, and I made it again at the beginning of this show, uh, that the only place on any significant media platform that you will hear the kind of views you've heard here this evening is here on the mother of all talk shows. And Adam represents uh, a different current, a different point of view, a counterbalance, if you like, in the final hour uh, of every show every week. We have to make our own media. We will never be able to counter uh, the power uh, of the existing mainstream media unless we stop buying it, unless we stop paying for it. And we can do that. We are millions of people. We are not a majority, but we are millions of people. And we must get out of the habit of imagining that someone else will deliver uh, salvation for us. We must take that salvation into our own hands. That's what I tr try and do every day on social media, on Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, here on the mother of all talk shows and every other place I can. Thanks for the call. Suraj is in London. Go ahead, Suraj. Hi, George. Absolute 
honour to be speaking to you. I've been following your stuff for the last, uh, say, four to five years since I was about 17. Fantastic. Um, Great. Uh, it's a very refreshing to hear these viewpoints Thank from you. an MP from the House of Parliament. So a lot of respect from Thank you. the you have accent, Ireland. Thank well, you, I'm my friend. At the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we must talk about Ireland, actually. We must talk about the political situation in Ireland now, uh, because the elections can't be far distant in Ireland. Uh, anyway, on yeah. you go, Suraj. Uh, well, on that point, in terms of Northern Ireland, it is absolute shambles up there. My family live in Belfast, and the political scene is so polarized. It's either Sinn Féin or DUP. It's very hard to get a meaningful result. And it's also quite irritating when the, the left side of the, the spectrum there, the Sinn Féin, don't even show up to the House of Parliament and make decisions on behalf of their voters. It's quite, uh, you don't really know what to do at that point. Um, my question, though, is regarding uh, Labour's loss in the most recent election. And it ties into kind of a deeper thing happening in Western society at the moment, which I think from my understanding of what I've read is this shift of grand narratives. The working class and general populace of America and the UK are being more and more polarized from their original vo voting parties, such as the Democrats or Labour, because the grand narrative has, is shifting and changing with the, the left sort of encompassing this moral vanguard of what you can and can't say. And I could not agree with what you were saying earlier to your previous caller about these words being thrown around and how they ultimately lose value because what is a fascist and what is well, a racist uh, yeah, now? That exactly. And I was just thinking today on the last word that you used. I'd like to ask people if they think that hurling the word racist at someone is likely to change that someone. Is it likely to, <laughs> is it likely to convert them, to persuade them, uh, to, to soften them? Uh, or is it likely... Uh, to make them bristle uh, with uh, indignation and anger and make whatever it is that you have found fault with worse than it was before you brandished that word. Do you see what I'm saying, Suraj? Yeah, I would be very inclined to agree with the latter. I think it definitely has the latter effect. It certainly seems to. Uh, the uh, the uh, so. fanatics for the EU spent the last uh, four years uh, nearly uh, three years, three and a half, uh, calling everyone who disagreed with them uh, a thick northern racist. And yeah, the, yeah. The, the North answered back a week on Thursday, didn't it? Yes, they did. And, George, I would say to that it's so strong that when I logged into Facebook after the Brexit vote, for, for which I voted leave, similar to yourself, mm. um, predominantly for the reasons of the, the EU's interaction with the African continent and how it is subdued in, in its economic policies towards Africa. Very good point. That, that's something I never heard spoken on the media. I was very sad. And when I brought it up to people, even to this day, who are staunch uh, Remainers, but also have generally in their heart are very good people and want to see the world a better place. I bring this point up and they look at me with blank expressions. They never yeah. knew it was happening. <laughs> We're racist for wanting to stop overwhelmingly <laughs> white people. Uh, coming to uh, Britain uh, from the European Union, uh, but it's not racist for the European Union, <coughs> excuse me, to build a fortress of itself against the people of the African continent and of Asia. Uh, it's, uh, it's a complete distortion uh, of, yeah. uh, of the idea of racism, don't you think? I think it's very bizarre. I think it's an extremely bizarre world we live in. And that ties into the bigger question. How does a kind of a party for the people, which Labour claimed to be, shift its grand narrative, grand narrative to then encapsulate its original voters while also maintaining, I guess, uh, the acronym is weird, the Western, educated, and industrialized, rich, and democratic? How do they keep both on the same page and move forward for the best of society? What's your views on that? Well, that's the best call of the night. That's my first view. Uh, and uh, the second point is there's not enough time to do it justice. Uh, I'm no doubt we will return to it. Uh, but the one thing you don't do uh, is ditch what you already had uh, for the chimera uh, of what you uh, think you would like to achieve. The task is to keep what you already have, 
and to build on it. And that's not what Labour did. Labour has been waging a culture of war against the uh, people of its own heartlands for many decades. I'll give you an example. I published, or rather reproduced, uh, data that the European Union themselves had published earlier this week, which showed that nine of the ten poorest areas in the European Union in Northern Europe were all in Britain. Nine out of ten of them were in Britain. Uh, a rush of knee-jerk uh, leftist response was, yeah, under the Tories. And yeah, they all voted Tory last week. But precisely the same nine out of ten were still the poorest in the previous ten years when Labour was in power. Adam. Well, <clears throat> I think that that's something that's very crucial, not least because when you look at industries that have been decimated due to membership of the European Union and due to the knock-on effects of membership, when you look at fishing, coal, car building, which is a huge one that people don't talk about. When we talk about the steel Even industry. Even though we're all still driving cars. Still, still using steel, still <laughs> eating fish. I mean, all of this uh, still needing electricity, which countries throughout the world, including Australia, wisely use coal. And you have modern clean coal technology, which gives you the best of both worlds for a good price. Things are entirely backwards because of membership of what isn't a free trading club, but a corrupt, rotten to the core cartel. And I'll be so, so, I honestly think that Britain leaving the European Union ranks among the most positive polit political events in my lifetime alongside the Berlin Wall falling down. And I don't say that lightly. Just quickly, one of the other points uh, that the caller mentioned about this being sort of an epoch making time. I think one thing that a lot of people have failed to notice is that unlike in the 80s and into the 90s, when the left right divide was all about economics. Milton Friedman versus John Maynard Keynes, Thatcherism and Reaganism uh, versus, let's say, Footism and socialism of a democratic nature. It's now, no, no one really talks about economic theory anymore. Everyone is talking about cultural issues. The left right divide is cultural. It's no longer economic for two reasons. One, because a culture war is taking place and the working class are fighting back. And number two, because everyone is frankly, equally economically incompetent. Uh, Suraj, thanks uh, for that call. Clear the decks. We have a legend on deck. It's Norma in Bristol. Last call of the evening. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Hello, Adam. Um, Hi there. It's, uh, it's a minority interest, really, and we've only got a few minutes. But um, I'm a bit upset because the BBC Red Button is going to be discontinued at the end of January. Now, um... For us older people, we might not have smartphones, they haven't all got computers, but I can see so quickly, like the results of tennis, the football, the table, the orders of play, and if that's taken away from us, we're going to lose all that information, you know? What is that? Is that like a kind of C-fax as it used to oh, be? Oh, no, you just, you just put on BBC One, you press a red button, and you've got a list of things. I always do the sport to see what's happening, and it's so quick and easy. If I wish I didn't in... know what happened in the sport today, but that's another oh, matter. Oh, I do, I know it all, I know it all. <laughs> what do you want to know if Chelsea no, beat Tottenham? Well, I know they did, they did uh, yeah. and I was happy <laughs> enough about that, because I like Jose Mourinho. But having watched Manchester United lose 2 nothing to the bottom of yeah, the table, Watford, Watford. Uh, I must yeah. say I was in uh, despair. So this red button is disappearing when? Uh, the end of January. And I mean, to be perfectly honest, um, you know, we are going to stop having our, in, in July or May, the licence fee is going to be, uh, you've got to pay it again. And I just think that perhaps a better idea is to not um, cut the red button, but perhaps pay some of these big presenters a little bit more money, less money. A I bit mean, less money, money, yes, less uh, money, indeed. Yes, uh, Norma, thanks uh, for that. I had no idea of the red button question. I will look into it and uh, see if there's anything I can advise uh, in due course. It's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you. And if it was, come back next week at the same time, same place. Spread the word. I'm still looking.
for my first million, my first million viewers and listeners, of course. That's the point. Thanks to Adam Gary, as always. Thanks to the very clever uh, men and women, overwhelmingly young, but one of them bringing the average age up, uh, <laughs> that make this show possible every week. And a big thanks to you for making this the fastest growing show on the planet. And I really am not exaggerating. May you all have a lovely Christmas and see you next week.